Good morning and welcome to the 19th meeting in 2020 of the Finance and Constitution Committee. Our first item today is to decide whether to consideration of a draft report on the pre-budget scrutiny for 2021-22 should be taken in private at future meetings. Are members agreed? Seeing no indication that there is disagreement in the chat bar, uh, we now go, therefore go to item two, um, which we will now hear from Mike Russell, who is the Cabinet Secretary for the Constitution, Europe and External Affairs on the UK withdrawal from the European Union Continuity Scotland Bill at Stage 1. Uh, welcome the Cabinet Secretary to the meeting and his supporting officials, Emma Lapinska, who is the Constitutional Policy Manager, Charles Stuart Roper, who is the Head of Environmental Strategy, and Francesca Morton, who is a solicitor in the Scottish Government. Cabinet Secretary, can I invite you to make a brief opening statement, please? Uh, thank you very much indeed. I just I think waiting for the camera to come on, which is not coming on at the moment. No, I'll just give it just just give it a couple of minutes, seconds, Cabinet Secretary. There we are. <coughs> Sorry about that, convener. Um, something obviously in glitch uh, in the in the mix. Um, thank you for the invitation to give evidence here today. If I can, as you suggest, give a brief opening statement, and of course I'd be uh, very happy to answer the committee's questions. These are uh, perilous days, weeks, and months for the future prosperity of Scotland, and indeed for the rest of these islands. The eighth round of negotiations between the UK and the EU takes place this week with very significant issues still outstanding. We are apparently hurtling towards the cliff edge of a no deal or a very poor low deal by the end of this year because the UK government has refused to seek an ex extension to the transition period. And in the middle of all this, a bill on the UK internal market will be published today, which will ride roughshod over the competence of the Scottish Parliament and the Welsh Assembly and will also severely damage the withdrawal agreement. In this context, I believe it's vital we take action now so that we can protect the interests of the people, businesses and the environment of Scotland. And this bill is crucial to that task. It's critical in ensuring that there continue to be uh, guiding principles on the environment of Scotland, and it will establish an environmental governance body to secure full and effective implementation of environmental law. It is critical also that it gives us the legislative tools we need to maintain some stability and consistency in our laws after the powers in the European Communities Act are lost. It's critical also to ensure that Scotland is able, where it makes sense to do so, to continue to align with EU law in the future, as indeed the people of Scotland expressed was their preference in the 2016 referendum. We've waited for over four years for clarity, and we can't wait any longer. It is for this Parliament to decide, for Scotland, how to legislate for these matters, and that is what the bill <coughs> aims to do. Camilla, let me briefly address some of the issues which I know have arisen during the course of the evidence you've taken. It's become clear to me that there are a couple of misunderstandings that I should clear up. And let me therefore clearly set out what the bill provides for. In recognition of the unique circumstances in which this bill is brought before Parliament, the power will expire after 10 years. The length of the sunset period is an attempt to provide stability, to avoid the potential need for numerous and different bills, to allow time for us to assess the impact of Brexit, and I'm sure, if I might say so, it will take us comfortably, very comfortably, through the period of, uh, of accession for an independent Scotland to the EU. For the purposes of clarity, I would also ask the committee to note that whilst the power at Section 1.1 will at some time expire, Section 3.3 makes clear that any regulations made under the power do not expire. Whilst Rosanna Cunningham is leading on part two of the bill, I'd also like to take the opportunity to clarify the scope of section 10.2. This duty requires UK ministers to have regard to the guiding principles on the environment when developing policies so far as extending to Scotland. This duty applies to all policy development by UK ministers, subject to the limited exceptions set out in the bill which extend to Scotland. Comparisons have also been made between Section 17 of the previous Continuity Bill and Section 10.2 of this bill, but Section 10.2 is a very different provision. Lastly, uh, I want to make clear that the Scottish Government's intention is to work with the Parliament 
to agree an appropriate and proportionate decision-making framework for future alignment with EU law. We all agree, I'm sure, that decision-making around the issues of which we might wish to align with EU law will vary depending on the specific measures being considered. As I said to the Environment Committee last week, the Scottish Government does not have all the answers. That's why working with the Parliament and others is so important. Now, I agree with those who have said that the broad nature of EU law and the different scenarios we might face makes agreeing such a framework on the face of the bill not only unhelpful, but actually very difficult indeed. But I am more than happy to commit to liaising with the Parliament to allow the Scottish Government to consider how an appropriate level of consultation with the Parliament and stakeholders at the earliest stage of policy development can be ensured and indeed built in. I want also to say to the committee that the Scottish Government is not ruling out the use of primary legislation where that would be the best and most appropriate legislative route, but it shouldn't be the default or the only route. Let me finally take the opportunity to remind the committee that in the Scottish Government's view, the power at Section 1.1, the core power, which I'm sure we'll talk about today, is a pragmatic, practical, proportionate power, which is both discretionary and time limited, and it will be subject to full parliamentary scrutiny. Thank you, Convener. <clears throat> Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. One of the real challenges which the Committee and the Parliament face in considering the Bill is obviously the ongoing uncertainty regarding the constitutional impact of Brexit on devolution. In particular, the future relationship with the EU still remains unclear. Common frameworks are still to be agreed, and now we have the possibility of the Internal Market Bill. Now, I know you have touched on this already, but given the level of uncertainty, can you give us a bit more detail about why you introduced the Bill at this time, with all of that mix of uncertainty that it currently exists? Well, this Bill has been delayed by the COVID pandemic. Uh, we, would be con we really should have been considering this Bill in the spring to early summer of, of this year. But that was not possible to do after the lockdown took place on the 23rd of March, and therefore the bill's uh, progress was delayed uh, by the pandemic. So um, this is later than I would have wished, uh, but it's still vital that we have the tools available to us. We should also not allow the agenda on this to be dominated or set uh, by the UK Tory government. Um, today is a significant day in terms of the publication of the Internal Market Bill. Uh, and in case anybody is tempted during this session to uh, attack me in any way, because um, you know we are objecting to that, I would draw their attention to the statement from the Welsh Labour uh, government last night, which I think, if anything, is in stronger language than any I have used. Uh, this is a major threat to devolution, and it's a major destabilising force. Uh, you know, it, for a government that the UK government that seeks stability, all it does is create instability, as it's continuing to do by its failure to come to a negotiated agreement with the EU. So what I'm trying to do is to ensure that we have the powers which we believe we need, the minimum powers that we need, to do some of the things to preserve European regulation, which the Parliament has already agreed we should do, because you know, a variant of these powers existed in the original Continuity Bill and indeed survived unscathed. Uh, but from the, 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 the challenge from the UK government in the Supreme Court. Um, I, I would really wish that the current UK government would see sense. I had a, another conversation yesterday with um, Michael Gove and Alex Sharma about this bill, uh, about their bill. I mean, I really wish they would see sense, except that the frameworks are the right way to go forward, a voluntary way to go forward. Um, I've given but my own assurances about those frameworks and how they would operate. Uh, and indeed, if there is anything missing in that program, as Michael Gove keeps claiming, though he doesn't say what, um, then we will, we will plug that gap. We should not be having the internal market bill. And the internal market bill, of course, has been made even worse by an admission, an admission by a UK government um, a cabinet member of its illegality under international law. Uh, it is almost beyond belief that we are in that position. Uh, I think the two questions I'm going to ask have been very general intentionally, because others will want to um, ask more detailed questions in these areas. You, you touched on the internal market proposals. Uh, in you, the Scottish Government's initial assessment of the UK's internal market proposals, you provided a case study for the potential impact on food and drink sector. 
um, and that, that stated that the continuity bill will allow the Scottish Government to keep pace with high environmental and social and regulatory standards provided by, by EU law, which apply to this sector. But we have also heard evidence that the internal market proposals potentially undermine these policy choices. Could you explain to us why you think that might be the case, and how the Scottish Government intends to respond to this potential constraint on the use of its devolved powers? And then we'll go to Murdo Fraser. Well, we have no intention of acceding to the um, to the Internal Market Bill. Uh, it is, you know, it is only just published today, though the speed with which it's being pushed through is is obscene in actual fact. Um, what we intend to do is to resist that bill. We, we resisted in the House of Commons. It will be resisted by uh, Wales as well as Scotland. Uh, it will be resisted cross-party, I'm sure, here, with the exception of the Tories. And we will continue to challenge it uh, in the House of Commons, in the House of Lords. We will look at other options for challenging it. So I don't accept it is a done deal by any manner of means. Um, I think it is quite clear, however, that were it to be uh, successfully passed, and if it were to be observed in Scotland, and were the, uh, 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 the UK to accede to lower standards, which I think is inevitable. I mean, I know the US-UK trade talks are recommencing today. Uh, I think The Independent has published something today about a, a documentation from last year's discussions in which full market access was what the US was seeking. Uh, and that means in agriculture, for example, a lowering of food standards. If those were lowered to allow the UK to accede to those trade deals, which will be because the UK is desperate to do those deals, uh, in those circumstances, then American pro providers and importers uh, could successfully go to law, in my view, to challenge high standards in Scotland. Scotland has a right to choose what standards it has. Scotland has had high standards as a member of the EU, and has a right to continue with those high standards. And they should not be undermined by uh, will or diktat from the UK Parliament, uh, which essentially leaves the Scottish people defenceless. And that's what will happen. Uh, so we are determined to oppose the bill, and we will go on opposing the bill. And it is not a done deal. Okay, Murdo Fraser, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Murdo. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, uh, Cabinet Secretary. I wanted to ask you about the issue of parliamentary scrutiny. There has been a theme in all our evidence sessions um, so far, um, and we have heard this uh, expressed in evidence from Professor McCarg, from Professor Keating, from the Law Society, the Faculty of Advocates, the National Farmers Union of Scotland, and others. And essentially, the concern is that while there may be a case for giving ministers powers to introduce by secondary legislation, what are minor changes to existing uh, EU laws? Um, less strong case, if there's a case at all, for giving ministers that power to introduce substantial new laws and significant policy changes, which should properly be done by primary legislation. And I notice that the same point is made in the report we've just seen from the DPLR uh, committee. So, ca can I ask you? I mean, how can you justify? proceeding with this bill, which is giving such sweeping powers to, to ministers to introduce new laws by way of secondary legislation? Well, I don't accept it's giving ministers powers, sweeping powers to introduce new laws by means of secondary legislation. So, presumably, the premise of your question is what I would, uh, I would take objection to, first of all. Uh, the reality of the situation is that um, we have made it clear, and indeed I did so in my opening remarks, that where primary legislation is required for particularly major pieces of, of work or legislation, we are open to that. But primary legislation is not required for uh, let more minor uh, pieces, nor for keeping pace with existing standards as they develop. Uh, it would be a waste of parliamentary time, uh, and it would be a means by which those who are opposed to any keeping pace would be able to frustrate the legitimate will of the Scottish people to keep pace with high standards. It would, in other words, be a Trojan horse that would be introduced uh, to stop this bill being effective. Now, the levels of parliamentary scrutiny within this bill are entirely clear. Uh, they consist of an either-or power. Um, and, of course, there is always scope in every bill. And <coughs> I don't think I've ever taken a bill through the Scottish Parliament that has not, in the end, um, had a major discussions about whether uh, negative, affirmative, or super affirmative power, uh, regulations are what should be legis uh, secondary legislation powers should be used. 
And of course, we can have that debate as we move uh, into stage two. And I, I predict that there will be amendments laid by you and others uh, to change negative to affirmative and affirmative to super affirmative. That is what happens. But it would be an astonishing use of parliamentary time if we were to have to use primary legislation to keep pace with every single European regulation. Nobody else does that. Uh, it is not required. The other issue I would draw attention to is the flexibility that I've indicated in my opening remarks as to the process we follow and the consultation we follow and the way in which people suggest we should keep pace. Because this is not something that government alone will decide. Uh, there will be committees of the parliament, there will be interest groups, there will be third sector groups, there will be businesses who will want us to ensure that the highest standards are maintained and we keep pace with European standards. For example, you know, on water quality regulation, which is a key issue, uh, there are new powers coming in through the EU which will deal with higher water quality standards and issues such as plastic, which it would be necessary and useful for us to adapt to, as we would have done as a member of the EU, as quickly as possible. So I think those are all reasonable ways in which to move forward with the highest level of parliamentary scrutiny and the highest level of content. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that response. I mean, you, you used in your response to me the argument that um, to proceed by primary legislation in the event of, of a new policy change would be a waste of parliamentary time. Now, I asked the bill team at the very start of this process if they could tell me how, they, how many uh, significant measures they anticipated would be brought in on an annual basis uh, under uh, this legislation. Uh, and they were not able to tell me that. So I cannot understand how the policy memorandum makes the case that it can't be done by primaries that would be too burdensome. You've just repeated that, and yet neither the bill team, unless you can tell us now, can give us a figure for how many primary bills we might be talking about, unless you can tell us that now. Well, quite clearly you would have to go through um, all the measures that we might intend to keep pace with and to come to some assessment as to whether they were major or minor. Uh, but no, no, well, if you would like me to answer you, I'm quite happy to answer you, but I do have to do the opportunity to do so. Um, you, could have, you would have to go through all of those and, and say, now, in terms of specific items, one set of items that might be subject to it uh, in a normal year, there have been up to 70 minor items which are changed, and that would seem entirely reasonable. But I don't think that we would wish to keep pace with 70. I don't think we have the capability, even with the secondary legislation, of keeping pace in that way. So regrettably, because the people of Scotland, as you know, voted to stay in the EU and are being dragged out of the EU against their will, regrettably, we cannot keep pace with the highest of standards in everything, even in the environmental sphere let alone in any other range of, of, of areas which we would be interested in. But to, to say that on every occasion when we wanted to continue to keep pace with, for example, an issue such as water quality or fish diseases, that we would have to go through the full primary route would be an astonishing waste of parliamentary time and would be a Trojan horse to stop these powers being used and would be used by people who do not wish Scotland to keep pace. The fanatical Brexiteers, who do not, who, for whom the very mention of European regulation is anathema, and I think the people of Scotland deserve to have the highest of standards, and that is what we're seeking to provide. Well, thank you for that response, but it's a very strange characterisation of Bodies Farmers Union for Scotland, who have expressed the concerns I've outlined to you today about, for example, new environmental measures being brought in that. Uh, and do not go through the full route of consultation and parliamentary scrutiny. To, to dismiss them as fanatical Brexiteers is frankly ludicrous. Well, I didn't do that. I, I would be grateful for that. Well, well what I, that is the term you use, Secretary, to cover people who have expressed concern about this bill. But if I can no, I conclude my concern question. about your approach to it, not their approach to it. I think you are misrepresenting there. Because for us, for those of us who are listening here, all we're hearing are two, are two sets of voices talking across each other. So if, if if each of you, in turn, could just you know not interrupt each other, that would be helpful. 
Could you know, just simply, like uh, I'm trying to ensure words are not put into my mouth. I did not yeah. criticise anybody. I indicated that there, there was an attempt to put words into my mouth, and I'm not going to take that. I understand that, but let's just so, so otherwise in this particular. Um, set up. It's very difficult for those members and probably the public to understand what's going on when those two talking across each other. Uh, and Murdo, you did interrupt Michael the first time, and he interrupted you in terms of your question. So you've both been at it. So just keep it to each one at a time, please. Thank you, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, perhaps I'll continue with my question. I think, that, I mean, just to, to close that off, the point I was making was the concerns over this legislation go far beyond. People who could be dismissed as fanatical Brexiteers, but we'll leave it at that. The, I, I suppose to, to, and I suppose this will be my final question, Commissioner. It's simply this: um, Cabinet Secretary, you uh, spent a lot of time talking about power grabs. This is exactly what this bill is, as it stands. It is giving sweeping powers to Scottish ministers to introduce new laws to Scotland without the required level of parliamentary scrutiny and consultation. That is what the responses have been telling us. To those who have given evidence to this committee over the previous week. So isn't it time for you to think again? Um, I, I know the Conservatives are keen not to allow legislation to proceed. That's what you'll be attempting to do this afternoon as well in, in another place. Um, uh, that is not the evidence you've been receiving. Uh, where there are concerns about uh, primary and secondary legislation, we've been prepared to address those. I have made clear in my opening remarks that uh, I think that uh, there is a ground for primary legislation in case of a major innovation. I have never denied that. Uh, you are the one who appears to be denying that. I am absolutely happy with that. But it would be, and I repeat this, both a waste of parliamentary time to use it for every small change of legislation, which is what you have been suggesting. Secondly, I believe that the Tory hostility to this bill and to the EU is unbalancing this debate, and I am prepared to stand up vigorously for the right of Scotland not to be a dragged out of Europe against its will, and secondly, have the high standards to which we are used and which we have in place trashed in order to have a trade deal forced upon us, a bad trade deal by the UK government. I will not have that, and I am determined to fight against it. Can I ask Alec Murley, is, is it a supplementary Alec that you wish to ask at this stage? Yeah. Okay, Alec Rowley, please. Thanks, convener. Can I just? I mean, I think the Tories are in complete denial of the devastating impact that Brexit is going to have, and sir, for we're unlikely to have a, a, a reasonable debate with any Tories. But can I ask? You highlighted there, cabinet secretary, like the example of higher water quality being being a really good example where we would want to maintain standards that the European Union have. But given all these different bills that are coming forward just now with Brexit, so there's a trade bill, the internal market bill, can I ask, are we confident that the bill that's going through just now, this bill, would be able to deliver on on the example you gave, higher water quality, or is there any of the other legislation going through the UK Parliament that could supersede and indeed overrule this? That would be my question. I, I think it's a very good question, Mr. Rowley, because I fear the, the situation of the internal bill will be used to undermine devolution in many of its aspects. Um, so it is also possible, and you know it's happened before, that the um, advocate general will attempt to challenge this bill, or the bill is clearly within competence and has been recognised as being within competence. But I think what we should do is to put in place the legislation, the regulation that we believe we need take forward the highest of standards, and I think we should continue to oppose those who are trying to stop that happening. Um, and, and should they continue to try that, then we should work very hard to, to stop that interference in the right of Scotland. And I, I make this point very clearly, and I know you agree with it. Whatever your position on this, in the Constitution, the areas which are devolved to the Scottish Parliament, the Scottish Parliament has the right to choose the standards that are applied and to ensure they are applied in Scotland. And that is a, a basic tenet of devolution. And in those circumstances, we should insist upon it, and we should pass legislation to show that we have that right. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Can I move now to Tom Arthur, please? Thank you, Convener, and good morning, Cabinet Secretary. 
Um, the context in which this bill operates will not only be determined by whatever legislation is passed by Westminster, but whatever agreement, if any, is reached between the UK Government and the European Union. Cabinet Secretary, can you update the committee as to regards to what dialogue you have had with the UK Government vis-à-vis their negotiations with the European Union? And with regards to um, scenario planning for after the 1st of January, what are the uh, central assumptions that the Scottish Government is working towards? Uh, thank you, Mr. Arthur. There was a meeting of the Joint Ministerial Committee on Thursday. Um, there was um, an update, if one can call it that, from David Frost given to the JMC. I, I can't say I learnt any more than I could read in the newspapers in those circumstances. And I, you know, all that I know is gleaned either from that, from the newspapers, or from conversations with, with others who are engaged in the process. Uh, I, I don't think it's just, you know, news to anybody to know that those talks appear to be deadlocked, and they appear to be uh, uh, particularly fractious, uh, particularly on the UK side, with all sorts of statements being made at weekend about, uh, you, you know, insisting that the EU understand the position. And then we have yesterday's unfortunate development in the House of Commons, where which has produced a, a very negative reaction, you know, even amongst the most friendly of, of, of countries, for example, in Ireland. Where both the the new Taoiseach and, and the Tanister have both have, and the foreign minister Simon Coveney in the last 24 hours have all indicated uh, real concern about uh, uh, the willingness to flout international law. So, uh, as far as I am concerned, uh, uh, all I fear is that this is a process that is going nowhere. Even if it was to produce a result, the result that the UK is looking for at the moment is is what I would have been calling a low deal. It is a very, very unambitious deal, and it's essentially the bare bones. And we should reflect, you know, never, never stop reflecting on the fact that the UK is the only country in history which has, has gone into a negotiation endeavouring to get a worse deal than the one it entered with. It wants to walk out of the room with a worse deal than what it already has. So I'm, I'm not sanguine about the prospects. <clears throat> I think whatever happens, problem. So we have a very active um, amount of work going on in. Government heading for <coughs> sorry the end of transition and the um, and the first of January. Um, I'm reporting regularly to the cabinet upon that. I can say that we are now getting and indeed as a result of the JMC. I think we've now had the, the reasonable worst case planning assumptions. Government, uh, we still do not get enough information on what they are doing. Um, there is a meeting. I think. Tomorrow afternoon with the, the Paymaster General, which is meant to look at one or two further details. But trying to get information at the UK government is often like pulling teeth, and it's information we need on transition. I should make a final point. When we've dealt with no deal planning, there have been two major occasions we've done that. There was a clear understanding, both I think were when David Liddington posed, there was a clear understanding between Liddington and myself and Liddington and Mark Drakeford and then Jeremy Miles in Wales, that this would be out with the normal politics, that we would find a way to ensure that we could work on this uh, without you know, the usual political difficulties. That's not the case now. Uh, we've seen that recently in other newspapers and elsewhere. This is a, you know, it's handled in a very political way by the UK government, which is designed to undermine and damage uh, other governments of, of these islands, and that needs to be regretted. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I'm conscious in these exchanges and in other exchanges we've had with um, previous evidence sessions with regards to this bill, we routinely slip into talking in abstract and legalistic terms. But I wondered for a moment if you could perhaps sketch out what the practical implications will be for perhaps your, your constituents, for example, of leaving without a deal or leaving with a no deal after 1st January. And how the powers provided for in this bill could help to address some of these concerns and issues? <coughs> well, I, I'm very nervous and, and concerned about standards, uh, food standards, environmental standards, uh, the range of standards that we would expect we would take as normal in, in Scotland. Uh, and the Internal Market Bill will, will allow all of those standards to be undermined progressively, and that's what will take place. The lower standards will be set, no matter what the UK government says at the present moment. Uh, the, the lower standards will be set, uh, and those are the standards that will be forced to prevail. So that that concerns me. And in food standards, for example, that's about basic health issues. You know, I mean, countries that have lower food standards tend to have more illness as a result of lower food standards, and that's simply reality. That's that's where things are. 
you could then, you know, uh, you, you could then take sectors and say, how will sectors be affected? I mean, I, for example, the Scottish um, uh, seafood producers were saying yesterday that they're very worried about a situation in which uh, they would have major amounts of phytosanitary inspection, which will hold up shipments and massively increase the cost of shipments of, of seafood going out of the country. Now, you know, if I look at my own constituency, we have a whole range of, of small seafood producers. I think the village of Tarbert has, has 11 or 12 processors, uh, and, and that will be hugely disadvantageous. And I declare an interest. I'm an honorary president of the Clyde Fishermen's Association. But I also know that there is a possibility that fishermen will have to base themselves in Ireland in order to take advantage of the uh, of selling stuff directly into the EU. So there are practical difficulties. I had a, a fascinating conversation earlier in this week with somebody who, who knows far more than I do about logistics. And the reality, for example, of exporting and importing is that the systems aren't ready. Uh, they're absolutely not ready. We know that from what the Holliers have been saying to the UK government, publicly saying to the UK government. Uh, and, and, and the person I was talking to me said, yeah, in, in the end, they can get the systems to work. They won't be working by the 31st of December. Some of the computer systems aren't even written yet. Um, but in the end, they can probably get to work year, 18 months or whatever. But the long term issue is all that business will be much more difficult and much more expensive. Uh, because there will be more bureaucracy and paperwork as a result of it, no matter what happens. And that's, you know, even if there is no tariffs, you know, and the, the great attention is on tariffs, the actual logistics of trade and on which jobs depend will become much more difficult. And there is no pot of gold at the end of this rainbow. You know, the implication is that once we've got shot of the EU, there will be some fantastic set of arrangements that we will have with America or, or Whoever knows, you know, Alpha Centauri, it's simply not going to happen. There isn't anything to compensate in the same way for it. So this is a downward spiral. And it's pretty tough for us as politicians to have to be honest with our constituents and say the UK government is presently forcing you into a downward spiral. That's why having an option of something else, of the normality of being an independent country as part of the EU, is a thing that we should also be talking about. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. And on that, for my final question on that point, um, you're right, there is a, an alternative future for Scotland rather than the bleak isolationism of Brexit. In your opening statement, you made reference to the sunset period for this bill being 10 years with opportunity for extension, and that this could include a period for the accession of an independent Scotland to the European Union. Now, given the support for independence is at 55%, Given that people of my generation in their 30s and younger overwhelmingly re rejected Brexit and overwhelmingly support independence, can you outline how this bill will enable Scotland, both as it stands at the moment before an independence referendum and after an independence referendum, to prepare for accession to the European Union as a full independent member state? Well, one of the useful effects of this bill will be to maintain regulation that would otherwise atrophy. You know, what you, you don't want to happen is for, for the standards to slip and to slip in a way that would take a long time to get back to them. I mean, you know, I'm absolutely certain that accession can be achieved well within, well, well, well within you know, any, any, any period within this bill. Um, but that having been said, you don't want standards to slip because the further they slip, the further back you have to come. So this bill has the useful effect of making sure that in the areas we choose, and we can't do in all areas, in areas we choose, we don't let those standards slip. Thank you. No further questions. Okay. Without, thank you, Tom. Um, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Now we go to Dean Lockhart. Dean, please. Uh, thank you, Convener, and good morning, Cabinet Secretary. I would like to bring uh, the discussion back to the, the terms of the, the continuity bill itself. And giving evidence to this committee, uh, Professor Eileen McCarg explained that whereas previously UK members of the European Parliament would be fully involved in the formation of EU law, this will not be the case in the future under the EU Continuity Bill. In her words, we will become purely rule takers. And the professor went on to say, in these circumstances, it seems very hard to justify putting extensive powers into the hands of Scottish ministers to keep pace. So, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, given these concerns, can he confirm what influence, if any, the Scottish Government will have on the future direction or content of EU laws? that it intends to keep pace with? 
Well, clearly I would be much happier, Mr. Lockout, if we had MAPs who were taking part in that process. And indeed, you know, that's what we should have. And that's what we aspire to have. And that's what we're not going to have because of the actions of your party and your government against the will of the Scottish people. So, you know, the regret in that is all mine, but the blame in that is all yours. But that having been said, uh, the best is the enemy of the good. What we really now have to do is to make up as much as ground as we can by trying to make sure that in the limited areas, because we won't have the space to do it entirely, in the limited areas in which we can keep pace and choose to keep pace, then we do so in, in the most effective way possible, and we do so in the way that has the, the most scrutiny possible. And that's what we're endeavouring to do. And as I said in my opening remarks, we don't rule out uh, primary legislation in particular significant areas, but we also believe that operationally and, and, and sensibly there are other areas that can come through uh, by means of normal parliamentary scrutiny and there will be parliamentary scrutiny as said to Mr. Um, Mr. Fraser you know the, the balance between negative affirmative and super affirmative uh, a resolution will be one no doubt that we will work out in the course of the bill as, as always happens but I don't think there is anything inherently wrong with the proposals um, and providing the Parliament has the opportunity to scrutinise and can also be proactive in the process of, of developing our approach, then I think that's beneficial. final point I would make is, of course, we will endeavour, uh, as third countries often do, by means of presence in Brussels and by active debate, to, to make it clear what our views are. It would indeed be far better, and I agree with you that, with that, on that, that we had full democratic participation in making these regulations in Brussels, and I really look forward to the time when we do have that again. Uh, thank you for that response, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, in an answer to Tom Arthur, you, you said that part of the, of the rationale of the bill was to maintain regulatory alignment with uh, the EU system. But if you adopt your ad hoc pick and mix approach to which regulations and directives to follow, surely that defeats the purpose of maintaining regulatory alignment and Scotland will end up in a regulatory no man's land. No, I don't follow that. Insofar as you know, we're able to do so, we will do it to the maximum of our ability, but we cannot do it all because we're being deprived of the, uh, the, 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 the core tool which is full independent membership. That's why we want to get full independent membership. But no, I don't, I don't think that uh, being only able to do it in, in, in some things, it, it's still better than not doing it at all, which is, of course, uh, what the UK has been trying to force us. That's the position they've been trying to force us into. Uh, and uh, we're not willing to be forced into that position. But the reason I raised that concern, Cabinet Secretary, is that that was evidence we were given in previous sessions and indeed, the Environment Committee had uh, received evidence that it's unclear whether Scotland will keep pace with the EU, adopt similar standards to the rest of the UK, or take a completely different approach. In other words, the evidence we got was that there is a risk that Scotland could be, in the end of the day, out of sync with the EU regulations and also out, out of sync with regulations in the, in the rest of the UK. Uh, and that's the uh, possible consequence of the EU continuity bill. Uh, does the Cabinet Secretary recognise the, the uncertainty this will create for business across Scotland, having to potentially comply with three different regulatory systems? In other words, EU, EU regulations for exporters, devolved powers in Scotland, and different regulations in the rest of the UK. You referred to uncertainty earlier. Doesn't this bill introduce massive uncertainty for, for business in Scotland? Oh, absolutely not. Uh, what it does is it provides certainty in the midst of the complete uh, burach of uncertainty produced by the UK, current UK Tory government, uh, it provides clarity, because the clarity is when we know European regulations, which people observe now, and we choose to stay with those European regulations, then that will be absolutely clear. Uh, I think you are, uh, with respect, trying to, to sow a bit of uncertainty yourself, I'm sure, unwittingly, but, you know, I mean, one could go on from three. One could say we could, we could align ourselves with other things. You could, you could build the, the confusion. It's actually very simple. We will want to continue as much as we can with European regulation. That is also democratic, because that's what the people of Scotland want to do. We do not wish to go down the aggressive deregulating line that the UK government is bent upon doing to lower standards in order to get bad trade deals. Uh, and we want to support Scottish business. 
And, and unfortunately, the internal market bill will also damage Scottish business because it will provide unfair competition to Scottish business because it will create the circumstances where businesses in England particularly uh, will be able to dominate the Scottish market. And we think that's very, very unfortunate. And we just wish that the Scottish Conservatives would stand with the rest of us to defend the devolution settlement and Scottish business against those encroachments. You'll be very welcome. Oh, well, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I mean, our priority, as always, is to protect and secure the internal market with the rest of the UK, which, as you know, accounts for more than 60 per cent of Scotland's trades and also protects more than 500,000 jobs uh, in Scotland, according to the Fraser Valander. So that, that's, I think, in all of this, the economic priority of the internal market bill is to secure that internal market as, as the priority. But, convener, I appreciate I've taken up quite a bit of time, so I'm happy to uh, leave it there. Thank you. We'll take that as a statement rather than a question, then, Mr. Dean. Um, in, in which case, I'll, I'll now go to John Mason. Uh, thanks very much, uh, convener. I don't know whether I'm depressed by all of this so far, but uh, anyway, we'll keep going. I mean, Cabinet Secretary, you've touched on quite a lot of issues around standards so far, and we had the National Farmers Union uh, of Scotland in, and I mean, they clearly want to sell uh, products to the rest of the UK, but they also want to sell products uh, to the rest of Europe, and they are, they are fearful that, for example, uh, poorer uh, um, uh, products be used in English farms, and then these products could come into Scotland. I mean, is it possible to square this circle? Can we can we maintain the high standards uh, with Europe at the same time as the UK appears to be undermining standards? And in fact, even if we have an agreement with the UK, uh, we we now know that we cannot trust them. Well, alas, that is true, Mr. Mason, and regrettably, the whole world is discovering that after yesterday. Um, uh, there is no reason why there can't be a sensible solution to all these problems. Uh, you know, the, the frameworks are the way to do so. I mean, Mr. Lockhart made his definitive statement at the end, clearly wanting to, to get the answer in before the question. But I just want to, to make it absolutely clear that I am committed to the highest of standards um, and, the, 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 and the absolute openness of the internal market. There's a lot of nonsense talked about the internal market, of course. I um, I was lectured on this by Alex Sharma yesterday on the history of the internal market, which I found a bit curious. I mean, you know, the, the internal market has not is is not something that has existed since time immemorial with one set of regulations for these islands. I mean, one can only really look at the fact that you know, even time was only regulated in 1840 with the arrival of the railways and and the uh, and I think the 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 the, the Great Western uh, regulated railway time. Up until then, there wasn't even the same time being observed in every every part of these islands. So the reality is that this is a comparatively modern concept, and it's a concept that can be dealt with uh, and will be dealt with and was meant to be dealt with by the frameworks process, which is if we discovered any impediment to the internal market, nobody's ever been able to point one out to me that this whole edifice of a bill from the UK is, is predicated upon a non-existent problem as far as I can see. But if, you know, if there is a problem, the frameworks can undoubtedly deal with it. And they are voluntary frameworks that we're putting in place. So I, we could we could actually short circuit all of this difficulty, all the time that's going to be spent upon this, all the angst that's involved in this, if we simply said, look, the work we've done on the frameworks has been good. There's more to be done. We can accelerate that. We can make commitments to ensure that there are no barriers within it. And actually, that is what the National Farmers Union said they wanted in the consultation on the internal market bill, as the Scottish Council for Development Industry, as a whole range of others said, look, we want the devolution settlement to continue as it is. We want the frameworks to operate, give them the opportunity to operate, and let's do it that way. And for a variety of reasons, the, the fear, I think, of, of not being able to impose trade deals, uh, the, and, and also what I think, I've called it before, I think a deep-rooted dislike of devolution within the current UK government uh, and a sovereignist view that they, you know, the Westminster Parliament must always have the final say, even in areas of devolved competence. We've come to this very unfortunate pass. You started your question, Mr. Mason, by saying you didn't know whether to be depressed or not. I think you should be depressed, but I think you should also be slightly hopeful that your know, sense might prevail, even with the current UK government. 
that made you feel okay, better. Thank, thank you very much for that answer. I've just one, one other point, which is a completely different point. Uh, we got evidence from some of the environmental witnesses that they were actually keen that we should go further and not just enable ministers to uh, keep pace, but to require ministers to keep pace. How would you respond to that suggestion? Yes, I, I mean I am aware that you know, as ever with a, <coughs> a piece of government legislation, you have uh, you have forces on both sides that, that want you to do things; those that don't want you to do it, and those who want to do more. I think we've got the balance about right, but I am I am more than willing to say that we should we should have means by which we can listen to and respond to people outside the parliament, people outside politics about what we should be keeping pace with. So whilst I don't believe we should be able to be mandated to, to keep pace, I do believe that we should be very sensitive to those who have views about what we keep pace with. Thanks, Convener. Thank you. Alec Rowley, I'm not sure in your supplementary effort whether that was also your main question. Do you want to ask a question now? Yeah, please, please. Thank you, Alec. Can I just pick up on that point, uh, Cabinet Secretary, you talked about frameworks, and I know that, that you, know, you say the Scottish Government entered that uh, with a, a real desire to try and make it happen. Perhaps you could maybe reflect on, because I know that Michael Clancy for the Law Society Scotland talks about dispute resolution, and he, he argues that the real idea would be to seek consensus in advance and avoid the dispute in the first place. And he talks about the JMC in there, but my understanding is, is it 20 years on for devolution that we really need to look at all these mechanisms? Are they not working as well as they could, given, given where we are, basically? I wonder if you could perhaps say a bit about that. To somebody who actually believes devolution is the best way forward, but that we have oh, yeah. to mechanisms. I, I respect that, and you know, I mean, I respect the position of the Labour Party in Wales equally on the the issue of they want to see an effective dispute resolution mechanism, and quite a lot of work has gone into that. It is a sort of sort of holy grail of of of, of, of devolution if you could get an effective dispute resolution procedure in place then you know you could at least get some stability into the current situation you could uh, be able to work well with people. I, I think I've said at this committee before that I was very struck hearing Leo Veradica one day at, at, at the British Irish Council talk about the way in which trust in the EU, that all 20, existing 27 members trusted each other, not because you know, they thought they were all nice people and, you know, and, and they, could, you know, they could go out for a drink with them, but because there was a legal framework on, the, on which that trust hung. The in actual fact, you knew there was a way in which you could enforce uh, how you had to work together. There is nothing like that in a relationship with these islands. This is an unwritten constitution. Essentially, the dispute resolution procedure presently is when there is a dispute, the UK government says nothing to see here, move on, please, uh, because it will not uh, you know, take seriously things like, for example, the, the fact that the money to the DUP in, 2007, in 2017 was not barnetized, but they simply refused to discuss the issue. <sighs> The barrier to dispute resolution is the medieval concept of the sovereignty of the UK Parliament, which means that it cannot essentially be overruled or bound or, 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 or subject to the same regulations as anybody else. If you could put in place the equity between those parliaments, you could have an effective dispute resolution procedure. It is still not been resolved. I mean, the, the intergovernmental review creaks on. Uh, I, I was involved in a meeting on, about it about three weeks ago. Um, and uh, you know that is the basic problem. Until the UK government accepts that there requires to be equity in the in, in, in the relationship, it'd be very difficult to see how it could work. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alec. A Angela Constance, please. Thanks very much, convener, and uh, good morning, cabinet secretary. Um, last week, uh, we heard some evidence from the, the Human Rights Consortium, and you're probably aware that in their written submission, they would like Section 6 of the bill to be amended, um, effectively to state that ministers should have due regard to their obligations under the Human Rights Act. Now, your bill were of the view that this is unnecessary. Um, Ms Snowden last week said that as the Human Rights Act is increasingly being challenged, at a UK level, that there is a need to do everything to ensure that it is secure in Scots law, and I wondered if you agreed with that or not. 
I do agree with that. I think it's an issue that we need to address as we move to stage two of the bill. Um, I think it is, you know, it is taken as read. And you know, you and I, I think, hope that we live in a world in which, which such things are taken as read. Regrettably, and even more so after yesterday, I don't think we can take anything as read, not even the rule of international law. So I am more than willing now to consider how we would move ahead with that one, and I shall ask my officials to have discussions with the relevant organisations to see if we can agree a way forward. Thank you for that, Cabinet Secretary. I think that will be very much appreciated. Um, human rights stakeholders um, are very supportive of the work that the Scottish Government is doing to bring international uh, human rights directly um, into Scots law. Um, but the keeping pace effort is about ensuring that we do not go below a minimum standard. So, given that the UK does not even see ECHR as the, a basic minimum in trade negotiations either with the EU or other countries, are we still not in real danger of being the poor man of Europe when it comes to human rights? It is distinctly possible that that is the situation that is developing. I mean, it's very, very difficult to predict what will happen next with the current UK government. I mean, if there is a genuine agenda to refuse to accept the norms of international law, uh, and to say that, you know, for example, treaties would not be binding if you choose them not to be binding. It's some incredible stuff. I mean, not just Brandon Lewis yesterday. I mean, and, and he didn't misspeak. I mean, clearly he was working okay. from from formal briefing. Um, you know, and, and I don't think he could have misread his briefing that much. Um, uh, you know, if he did not, but others were doing so. I was astonished to hear Bernard Jenkins yesterday, who's not an unreasonable human being, um, it, it, making it clear that he always felt, he always knew. Uh, because he was obviously told by the UK government that they would repudiate uh, this, and, and all you had to do was to vote for it and sign on for it to get yourself past the hump uh, of, of leaving the EU, and then you could cast it aside. Now, I, you can't do business in those terms. I mean, you know, I, I, in a sense, I, I, I feel that I've had this experience for far too long in dealing with the UK government. It doesn't surprise me. But it does depress me that we've got to that stage, and it's been getting worse and worse. Uh, and I think in those circumstances, we need to find ways to reassert in Scotland uh, what we believe and the values we have. And, and I would make the point, these are mainstream European values. There's nothing exceptional uh, about what we're talking about. They are ordinary, mainstream human values, European values, which we would take as red, but which now appear to be almost exceptional in what the UK believes. You know, the Cabinet Secretary makes the point that human rights and other values are uh, very often agreed um, at an international level. And he's also made the point this morning that um, Britannia waives the rules, um, both its own rules uh, as well as international agreements. But the purpose of uh, Mr Russell's bill is, as I understand it, as much as possible to prevent Scotland going backwards trying to mitigate being dragged out of the EU against her will. But at the end of the day, how on earth can we compensate for a low or no deal? How can we compensate for trade trumping our rights? And how can we compensate uh, for the biggest uh, power grab, or as you describe, assault um, on devolution? So is there just not a bigger point here? Is there just not a bigger bill here, perhaps, that just, you know, at a fundamental level says we're really just not prepared to put up with this. And we're not prepared to put up with it any longer. I mean, I'm, you know, much older than Mr. Arthur, not quite as old as the Cabinet Secretary, but you know, can we not just get them tell? Hi. I think I think you're absolutely right. And and I think we're we're at that stage, and I think being blunt about it does no harm. I'll take that as your last question and point, Angela, and move on to Patrick yep. Harvey. Patrick. Thanks very much, uh, convener, and um, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, okay, two questions. Can I first of all just pick up on, on this issue around uh, keeping pace and whether uh, the Scottish Government should be able to or should have a duty to? One of the examples that was raised uh, last week was glyphosate. Um, the, 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 the decision a couple of years ago uh, was not to 
bring in a ban on glyphosate at EU level. There's a very strong argument in favour of a ban, uh, but at that point it was put off for a few years, and I think we're expecting that decision to be reviewed uh, in a year or two's time. If, and I think in that time Germany has since changed its position, if the balance within the EU, subsequent to the UK leaving and not having a vote in that decision, is that they do support a ban on glyphosate, and the UK continues not to support that, you would take the view that the Scottish Government should not be required to keep pace by introducing that ban, but should be able to make that decision. Would you also accept that this bill needs to provide the opportunity for people in Scotland to challenge that decision in either direction, uh, that if yourselves or a future Scottish Government was to decide to go with the UK position rather than the EU, we can't have a, a, a framework for these decisions that allows that just to be nodded through. Uh, it has to be open to challenge publicly, not just through consultation, uh, but through public engagement, uh, and also in Parliament through a formal process. Is, is that reasonable, and is that what this bill achieves, uh, or is there a danger that it gives too much powers to minister, uh, too much power to ministers simply? To make a decision and have Parliament take it or leave it. I, I think it does give the, the power of challenge is, is there. I mean, the power of challenge is always there in terms of, for example, judicial review of, of a decision. But the power of challenge is there within the bill. I mean, you know, th th there is a power of challenge to any decision that is made in the bill because it's not made you know, without regulation, and regulation can be challenged. But I do think there is an issue, uh, you know. Let me take that actual example. I can't imagine the circumstances in which that must not become a live debate, you know, as this issue is revisited. I think it will be a very active debate. I'm quite sure in this Parliament, you know, the Environment Committee would wish to be part of that discussion. I'm sure that the third sector would wish to be part of that discussion, and the government would want to be and should be mindful of that debate before it makes its decision. And when it makes the decision to ban or not ban, to, to keep pace or not keep pace, then you know that is challengeable by politicians, members of the parliament, through the committee structure and through the regulations as, as they will go through or otherwise. And it is also, as I say, subject to the normal challenges of judicial review, for example. So I don't I think it is in there. I think it should be in there. I think the difficulty with mandating and the, and the opportunity to mandate to keep pace is that it is indiscriminate, and, and I think that you know, the, the government will find itself pretty overwhelmed in those circumstances. And, and this is something that's going to take resource. We are not, we do not have unlimited resource. So, at the present moment, whilst we are not an independent member, I think we've got the right solution. When we return to full membership, we will be mandated because it will be you know, our duty to, 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 to observe these regulations, but we will also be in the process of making them, uh, and that will be a very healthy thing to be. Maybe by focusing on, on Roundup, I'm making the same mistake as those who focus on chlorinated chicken, that um, you, know, you, you, you just have one issue that everyone fixates on, when actually there would be hundreds of lower-level issues that don't become mm -hmm. mega political debates. Yeah. Uh, would, would you agree that there is at least a case, at least a case, uh, for a sifting mechanism uh, to ensure that the proper level of scrutiny is brought to bear uh, on these these measures, uh, rather than um, you know a, a danger that we have the lowest common denominator in terms of scrutiny and debate? I think the sifting mechanism lies in the existing committee structure and those who will be concerned about this. When this it is known that this power is in the army, when we have this power in the army, and providing it is not treated in the same <coughs> disgraceful way as was the previous power treated by the UK government, then it, when we know this is in the armory, then I would be highly surprised if, if each and every committee of the parliament was not considering issues that it wished to be included in this way. I, I'm not necessarily in favour of a new sifting committee. I think you know, we have difficulty staffing the structures that we have. I, I'm not sure that we would want more structures, but I do think there will be an opportunity for each committee to do this, and I'm happy about that. And I, I said in my introductory remarks, I, I mean, I am giving thought, and I'm very happy to take thoughts for others, too, about how that whole process can work, and, and maybe we should continue to talk about that as we go into to stage two and stage three.
Well, I think there probably will be opportunities to, to look at a, a number of options at, at stage two. But uh, I wanted also to ask about the um, the interaction of, of this bill with the internal market bill and with future trade agreements. Uh, a number of other members have already discussed this with you. So rather than going over the same ground again, let's just acknowledge the UK government and the Scottish government have fundamentally different purposes here. One wants to uh, maintain a close relationship with uh, the European Union with a view to getting back in. Uh, the other wants to cut those ties uh, and have a deregulation agenda, or at least permit a deregulation agenda. These are not compatible objectives. And so the question uh, rests with where does power lie? Uh, you know, is there not a case? Is it, is it not overdue, in fact, that the Scottish Government takes that question to court uh, and asks whether the UK Government's interpretation of its power to legislate, not normally in devolved areas, actually whenever it sees fit? Not, not normally, apparently, to the UK Government just means not unless we feel like it, not unless we want to. Is it not time for the Scottish Government to take that to court? Uh, and seek a judicial review on what that means, because there can there can be no resolution uh, of this with with any kind of equanimity if there is no equanimity of power. I don't disagree with your analysis. Um, I think it is about power. I think it is about the misuse of power by the UK government. Uh, I think, you know, without a doubt, and, and their overbearing approach to this is, is, is very clear. Um, I, I am cautious always about going to court. There is an unwritten constitution, and it is very difficult to enforce that. But I can say to you, as I have said before to this committee, and I am happy to say to you again, I have not ruled out any actions. I am not necessarily going to advertise those actions before they are taken. I have not ruled out any actions at all, and, and I hear clearly what you are saying. There may be a range of, of, of legal options in front of us, uh, but I wouldn't want to go any further than that at this stage. Okay, thank you, Davina. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, George Adam, please. <coughs> Mr. Sure. Adam. Yes, yeah, just waiting for my camera to go in there. Convener, thank you, Convener. And good morning, Cabinet Secretary. I'd like to ask about just to go into a wee bit more detail about common frameworks, because to me, if you have people with uh, different opinions, uh, different ideals, different beliefs, surely having uh, sitting down and having that opportunity to be able to discuss them uh, and take them forward is uh, surely a more sensible manner than actually the proposals from the UK government at the moment, which is effectively to, as you've already said, run shuff, uh, roughshod through devolution. Cabinet Secretary, what, what are the threats that we face because of this attitude, and uh, how do we try and find a way to get some form of compromise with a UK government that appears not to? Well, you know, the, the compromise is there to be had, um, you know, and, and, and I've made that very clear, and I've not only made it clear you know, in committee appearances, I made it very clear, for example, again last week at the Joint Ministerial Committee. Um, you know, and I made it clear yesterday in my conversation with, with Alex Sharma and, and, and Michael Cove. The solution is, as you say, with a civilised and sensible approach in which we sit down with the frameworks and we say, uh, is there anything missing from this programme? Uh, Michael Gove asserts there is, but he hasn't said what. If it is missing, let's put that in place. Let's make a commitment, all of us, that we will operate as if the frameworks are in place while we finalise the details of them. And we will make a commitment to placing no barriers in the way of internal trade, which we, there are no barriers. We, we've never had any intention of putting any barriers in place. Neither has anybody else, as far as I can see. So it's an entire chimera. But if that makes Michael Gove feel better, then there'll be no such barriers. That's available to us. We could do it today. And, and that would then resolve this issue. But instead, uh, what the UK want to do is, is twofold. They want to bring this bill in, and then they also want to make assertions about the bill, which frankly aren't true. I mean, I, I read, I read the, um, the, the comments from the Secretary of State for Scotland, um, Alistair, Alistair Jack, uh, and, and they are simply untrue, I'm sorry to say. The, 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 the internal trade issue is not at risk. There is no threat to the internal trade in these islands. Uh, and to assert there is, and moreover, to say 
that that threat would lead to the loss of 500,000 jobs or something is just not true. And I think this is being deviled by that type of spin and bluster, because the resolution of this is, is very, very simple. It should never have come along in the first place. And you know, in case people think that this is just you know, the SNP yet again, go and look at the statement from the Welsh Government. And you will see that, if anything, they're even angrier about this, because they know they put the effort in as we've put the effort in to try and make the frameworks work. And they're there. And it is well, it's just extraordinary that, that any responsible government would behave in this way. Cabinet Secretary, you've said that the UK internal market bill that's going to be published at one point today, if it's not already been done so, uh, is a major threat to devolution. Uh, and you said you hope the UK government sees sense. Ever the optimist, you've said you hope they, they see sense. But, you know, the... The narrative from many of our unionist colleagues uh, on this committee seems to be along the lines that, uh, you know, this is just the nationalists trying to pick a fight. This is us just uh, the way we are. We can't help ourselves. But, you know, when I've been looking at some of the, and I know Twitter isn't the centre of the universe and everything's going on, but even with unionist correspondents, I've got one here that actually says you can't run a complex union state like the UK is a majoritarian un unitary state. You know, if even unionist correspondents are writing things like that, surely, surely, uh, you know, as you say, people should see sense and we should be able to have that conversation. It's not just the nationalists, it's the Welsh Government as well. So surely, surely we can get to a place where we can get that compromise. I, I entirely agree with you. I, I just we have a we have enough difficulty you know in dealing with whatever the outcome of the negotiations is, whether it is no deal or low deal our hands are going to be full for the rest of this year, coping with that. Something we didn't ask for, we didn't vote for, we're having to cope with it. The whole of the last four years is a story of, of a failure to compromise by the UK, starting with Theresa May's failure to talk sensibly to people and to bring people into discussion. And it has simply been a story of, of galloping extremism which has deliberately excluded other points of view, as you say, in a majoritarian sense. And it has led us to this. It has led us to you know, the spectacle of a UK cabinet minister endorsing you know, essentially illegality yesterday in the House of Commons, and a bill which is unwanted, which the Scottish Parliament has voted against, which the Welsh Parliament will vote against, which we will not give legislative consent to, I'm sure, in Scotland. They will not give it in Wales. There is huge upset in Northern Ireland. The whole process of peace process in the Northern, Northern Ireland and the establishment and, and continuation of, of this of Stormont is all at risk because of this utter obsession about something which, in our looks, the majority of the people in these islands no longer support. It's an utter tragedy. And, and if only there was a sense, a reasonable sense of a way out, then how good that would be. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary, and thank you, Kavina. Okay, lastly, Cabinet Secretary, final question from me um, around the, the issue of common sense and a way out. Now, understandably, the Scottish Government have put a lot of store in the common frameworks, and that being, and these being the, the process to enable a sensible way forward um, for the whole of the islands of the United Kingdom. I just wonder. If these negotiations on the current frameworks are still going on, can how, how how can they possibly proceed to success at the same time as the UK internal market bill is proceeding through the House of Commons? Does that not really mean potentially the end of common frameworks? Well, I, I think it's a it's a very sensible question. Um, it's not just the frameworks process, very important as that is. The intergovernmental review. How could, how could you continue with an intergovernmental review with people who who refuse to listen to you, who refuse to accept any of the arguments you put, and who who are whose aim is to remove your powers? So I think this is an immensely serious threat to everything that we've been doing, and it's utterly unnecessary. But yes, I, I mean, you know, frameworks. We put a huge amount of effort into frameworks. Um, you know, and 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 you know, the Welsh government, I'd say, feels it even. I think even more strongly than we do, that this is being thrown away, completely thrown away. 
because of a desire by one or two people in, in the UK government to do down devolution and to try and make sure that they can get the type of trade deals they want. It is it is shocking and it is tragic. Cabinet Secretary, can I, can I thank you and your officials for giving us evidence this morning? Uh, I'm now going to suspend the committee for about five minutes to ensure our next panel of witnesses are ready, and I'll put in the chat bar ready when we're about to recommence. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you.
Our next evidence session is our first pre-budget scrutiny evidence, which is focusing on the impact of COVID-19 on the public finances. Today, we will hear from the Scottish Fiscal Commission on its fiscal update published last week. I would like to take the opportunity to welcome <coughs> our new um, Fiscal Matters Advisor, David Phillips, and thank him for his very helpful briefing paper. I would also like to put on record our thanks to David Eisner for all his hard work as our previous advisor. I now welcome our witnesses to the meeting, Dame Susan Rice, who is the Chair of the SFG, Professor Alistair Smith, the Commissioner, and Claire Murdoch, who is the Head of Social Security and Public Funding at the SFC. Before we move to questions from the committee, I am going to invite um, Dame Susan to make some short opening remarks, but can I remind members to direct their initial questions, at least to Susan Rice, who will field these questions. So, Dame Susan, would you like to make a short opening remark? Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner. Good morning. Is it still morning? Yes. Um, and thank you for asking us to give uh, evidence today. Um, I shall start with a few publications we released in the last week and a half. But um, but don't worry. Um, in the words of Henry VIII to each of his wives, I won't keep you long. Um, you'll need time for questions. So first, our fiscal update report. As you'll be well aware, the coronavirus pandemic has had a profound effect on the fiscal and economic outlook in Scotland and the UK. In our second fiscal update last week, we set out the latest position of the Scottish budget. We discussed the potential variations in the budget which the government will have to manage this year, and we consider the effects of COVID-19 on the economy. I'll say something briefly about each of these three areas. The Scottish budget has increased by three billion pounds since the Scottish government presented its summer budget revision in May. It now includes a six and a half billion pound pounds of guaranteed funding from the UK government for spending related to COVID-19. This funding largely addresses one of the concerns we raised in our last fiscal update in April. We highlighted then that uncertainty about the level of funding from the UK government could make it difficult for the Scottish government to balance its budget. While this guarantee, along with the fixed funding for income tax for the year, do provide greater certainty, there are still some areas of the budget where the government continues to have uncertainty. Uh, LBTT, as well as landfill tax revenues, along with devolved social security spending vary in year, although we expect variations largely to be offset by changes in the block grant adjustments. We don't know what those will be yet, but when we get to the Scottish budget, likely in December, we'll have updated forecasts of Scottish revenues and spending and updated forecasts from the OBR to inform the BGAs. At that point, we'll have a clearer picture of the Scottish budget. Our report also sets out our initial expectations for the Scottish economy. The latest data suggests the economy shrank by nearly a quarter between February and April. Since then, we've seen a gradual resumption of economic activity, and we expect GDP to rise rapidly as economic activity resumes more fully. However, we anticipate GDP will remain below its pre-crisis level until 2023. And that's because over this period, unemployment is likely to be elevated and earnings will be lower for many people. We expect some permanent damage to the Scottish economy. It's probably fair to say the economic and fiscal effects of this crisis will be felt for years to come. Our report highlights the large increase in UK government borrowing to fund the UK-wide response to the crisis. We note how, at some point, this will need to be repaid, and that will potentially affect the Scottish budget as well. Our report also noted that next year, the Scottish government will need to manage the income tax reconciliation that relates to 2018-19. The relevant outturn data will be published uh, in a fortnight on the 23rd of this month, and we will publish an evaluation of those data on the 5th of October. So enough on our fiscal update. I turn now to our annual forecast evaluation report for 2019-20, which mainly covers the period before the impact of COVID-19. While there's individual variability taken collectively, our forecasts of devolved tax revenues and of Social Security spending were within 2% of the outturn, 
in the world of forecasting, that's pretty good, though I think the technical way of saying so is that this outcome would be considered reasonable. However, we know that COVID-19 will significantly alter the world and the forecast errors for the current financial year are likely to be greater. The third publication is our statement of data needs, which sets out the areas where we believe improved information would support our work. Relevant to the fiscal update I just spoke about, we highlight how our work on the Scottish budget has developed, and we describe a variety of ways it would be improved through better or timelier provision of data or information. Alongside these three publications in the last 10 days, we also published two policy costings to accompany Scottish government legislation relating to social security. The first was for the new child winter heating assistance, and the second for the new Scottish child payment. And our forecast of this takes account of the large increases we've seen in universal credit claims since March. So with that, I'll hand back over to you, convener, for the question and answer session. Thank you, Dame Susan. Thank you, Dame Susan. If I may, I'll, I'm going to start off the, 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 the session. Um, obviously, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, there are going to be risks to the Scottish budget. And I'm interested what the differential effect might be on Scotland, both in terms of the impact on the Scottish economy relative to the rest of the United Kingdom, as well as public expenditure including devolved social security benefits relative to the rest of the United Kingdom, because as we all know, obviously, the fiscal framework is very much on the issue of relativity. So I just wonder you know, what consideration that the, the Fiscal Commission has given to any potential differential effect uh, and what that might mean. Uh, so, um, I might turn to my colleagues to um, augment our response to your question. It's a good question. Um, one of the things that we've done initially in looking at uh, the economic impact is to look at the change to our economic activity and to GDP um, as compared to what's happening across the UK. Uh, and in fact, so far, what we've seen is that our changes have roughly been in parallel to what we see uh, in the rest of the country. That doesn't mean that we'll continue forever or not, but we haven't seen a big divergence. Obviously, um, lockdown has been handled in some respects differently in um, Scotland from uh, England. In fact, the, the four nations are you know, m making uh, differences in how they respond to uh, lockdown. In, in, in Scotland, um, the cessation of work in the construction sector um, was was sort of bigger and longer than elsewhere. So we may also see timing differences in terms of recovery uh, because uh, those activities have to come on board and work has to begin to have an impact. Um, so those are a couple of uh, a couple of areas where we have considered um, what the differences might be. Um, if I could perhaps turn to uh, Alistair, would you like to augment my comments? Or Claire. Uh, yeah, yes, Susan, I'm, 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 I'm happy to come in. Uh, I, I don't have much to add. Uh, I, as you say, the, it, it, where we've looked at the differential effects, they haven't turned out to be significant so far. Uh, but we have recognised that this is a risk and something that we will need uh, to keep a close eye on, uh, given the limited powers that the Scottish Government has to to borrow uh, to to meet uh, particular needs, uh, should they differ from the needs that are funded through what's going on in, uh, in UK government funding. Claire, do you want to say anything? Yes, thank you. I can just add on the fiscal side of, of things. So um, you're exactly right that it depends about the relative performance of Scotland and the rest of the UK in terms of the effect on the Scottish budget. We're still pretty early in this, this period in terms of the data that we have on tax and social security. I'll turn to tax first. We have um, so the, the, the taxes which affect the budget this year is LBTT and SLFT, the ones which have the direct effect in year. On LBTT, we have some evidence that transactions in Scotland took slightly longer to, to return to higher levels, 
um, than they did in England because the housing market took slightly longer. In terms of what that means for tax revenues over the year, we'll need to see how that plays out. It's still pretty early and you know, months difference in the opening of the housing markets might not make a huge difference over the whole year. Um, in terms of social security, the largest benefits are administered by DWP and are on pretty much the same rules as, as the UK government ones. So changes which are happening there, we would expect to be broadly similar in Scotland and the rest of the UK. It's on the, the smaller benefits which are administered by Social Security Scotland, where we might expect there to be a differential impact. And those are benefits that don't have block grant adjustments. So for example, the Best Start grant is paid to families on low income benefits. Um, in, in receipt of universal credit, for example, and what we expect to see, but we haven't got the data yet, is that as we have a higher number of families in Scotland receiving universal credit, more people will be paid that benefit. But it's still quite early to see that in the data. By the time we get to our next forecast, we will have more information about this. We'll update our forecast, the OBR will update theirs, and we'll have a better picture of what's happening in both the, UK, the rest of the UK and in Scotland, and what the effect is on, on the Scottish budget. But you're absolutely right, it's about that relative performance which will affect the Scottish budget. Okay, thank you. Uh, can I ask one final question before we go to Murdo Fraser? I've got some concerns around the issue of the £6.5 billion guarantee. Not the, the actual um, amount itself, but how, as a parliament, and how the Scottish Fiscal Commission, indeed, will be able to scrutinise exactly what's going on there, because in particular, any additional funding for England um, will, will not generate any additional funding for the Scottish Government until the Barnett formula implies that the total amount received should be greater than £6.5 billion. Now, according to our advisor, that implies that just over £8 billion can, can be announced in England before the Barnett formula will apply to Scotland to receive um, should it, before the Barnett formula applies to the Scottish Government receiving more than the £6.5 million funding guarantee. So there's potential for lots of announcements, um, creating confusion, um, because the UK Government are, are announcing, is announcing new money that might not actually apply to Scotland until, there's, until that figure of £8 billion of new money has been reached, in which case will be over the £6.5 billion mark in Scotland. So. How are the Scottish Fiscal Commission going to go about um, scrutinising that, and what, how much comes into the, the, the Scottish budget, um, or, or otherwise? And what advice would you give to the committee? Um, thank you for uh, quite a, a challenging um, question. Um, I would perhaps just remind everyone that the uh, offer of guaranteed funding in relation to actions around the pandemic. Um, was uh, a request um, and came out of discussion between the Scottish Government and the UK Government. The Scottish Government, as we all know, has to have a balanced budget, and having complete uncertainty around all of this extra funding was just you know, beyond anything that was reasonable. And so the guaranteed funding was welcomed. Um, yep. The understanding is that if less were spent by the UK Government, the Scottish Government would not have to reduce that 6.5 billion, but if more was spent by the UK government, um, that more would come to Scotland. In terms of the timing of that, um, that is a, you know, a matter for, it's a political uh, matter. It's not something that, that we could uh, speak to. Um, what matters with the Scottish government hat on is it's the, the budget for each year. Uh, so even if, so I know you asked about scrutinizing, but I think it's helpful to understand the um, framework around this. If the um, British government said it was spending a lot more and some more would go to Scotland, but it was towards the end of this year and that came next year, um, that might cause some issues as well. So it's, it's a matter of understanding uh, the mechanism here as well as the actual amounts. Um, Claire, could I ask you, I don't want to lean on you too much, but I think you have quite a keen understanding of this space. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Susan. So just, just to add to that, obviously the amount that Treasury have guaranteed the Scottish Government so far 
it will not go down but obviously if the UK government make further announcements the Scottish government will receive extra funding and you're absolutely right that there will be a point where if, if the announcements continue to be made there'll be sort of no new funding coming out of that and then after a certain point there will obviously be more funding coming to the Scottish government potentially this can happen quite late in the financial year as well so when the supplementary estimates are presented to the UK Parliament normally in February at that point there could be um, revisions to this figure and that's quite late in the financial year for the Scottish Government to deal with and essentially that was why I think the UK Government made this offer to guarantee the funding was to provide a minimum level of certainty but if there are further announcements or higher spending in, in England then obviously the Scottish Government may receive extra funding quite late in the financial year and then they either if they can't spend it in the financial year, they can put it in the reserve and manage it in that way. Okay, thank you. Murdo. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Convener. Uh, good morning, uh, Dame Susan and colleagues. Can, can I just start by picking up that last point, uh, 6.5 million? Uh, is, it, is it not just the point of this that this gives the Scottish Government some certainty in terms of budget planning, that they are not relying upon wrong announcements of Barnett Consequentials, but in terms of this financial year, they know what the overall envelope is going to be, and that is not going to go down. It could, but it is not going to go down. Is that, is that not the, the, the key issue here? Um, yes, the, the £6.5 billion pounds, um, that have been um, given to the Scottish Government will not will not go down. I'd also point out that um, certainty comes from having fixed um, revenues or fixed expenditure. And so in addition to knowing that six and a half billion pounds is available, um, income tax is fixed. It's a fixed number for the for the budget year. Obviously it becomes reconciled a couple of years later, but for the year that is a a quite a lot, a big chunk of the Scottish budget that is also fixed. Um, there are um, variables because they are variables where um, funding moves within year, as in housing transactions, um, the uh, revenue from LBTT comes at the point of each transaction. Um, so it's 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 sporadic and periodic, if you will. Uh, Social Security expenditure is also something that happens in year and can change in year. Although since the payments are monthly, um, it's a little more certain. So the Scottish government is not relieved of all uncertainty, but the combination of the 6.5 billion certain and income tax certain, which is nearly double that amount, does give the government a fair amount to work with. Sorry, Murdo, just for absolute okay. clarity. Just sorry, Murdo, just for absolute clarity before we go off that point. Um, I welcome the guarantee. It's 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 a, it's, a, it's a good thing to have. But um, currently, the the maximum ban room that the Scottish government's got is five point seven million. It, we don't necessarily we will not necessarily reach that guarantee amount. It's just there if we need it. Just, I think I want to just make sure that's on the record because in case that. With, becomes unclear. Am I, am I right in that, Susan? Um, I believe you are, but you can speak perhaps for the Parliament and the Government, whereas the Fiscal Commission can't tell you exactly what you've spent. But my understanding is um, the six point five billion has not all been allocated, if you will, yet. Okay. Sorry, Mardo. Sorry to interrupt. This. No, that's, that's okay. I've I just got a couple more questions. Just. Following on from the convener's original uh, line of questioning around um, differential impacts, um, one of the things we know is that levels of public spending per capita in Scotland are much higher uh, than the UK average, uh, and therefore the public sector is a, a larger part of the Scottish economy uh, compared to the UK as a whole. And I wonder if that is factored into your your assessments of any likely differential impact on Scotland from, from COVID and uh, uh, the economic consequences of that? Um, again, um, a, a good question to ask. So, um, if we look at, for instance, um, Social Security, so I'm looking at the devolved areas that we deal with. If you look at Social Security spending, some of the benefits that have Gone live, if you will, um, you know, and, and most of them have now under the Scottish government jurisdiction. 
Um, some of those have been changed uh, in terms, in, you know, in specific terms, in terms of eligibility, in terms of ease of applying. Um, the, the child payment is a new payment, so um, the Scottish government is making available um, more uh, under that social security heading to its um, population. Uh, so, you know, that it's correct to say that we're aware of that. The government's job, because it has to have a balanced budget, is to know what it's spending and to balance the budget. So if, you know, we've said this in past sessions with this committee at times, if it needs or wants to spend more in one area, it may have to spend a little less somewhere else. So I don't know if that absolutely answers your question, but um, we're certainly aware of some of those differences. And we consider those in, in looking at what we do. Okay, thank you. And just just one one more one more question, and it's picking up something that's in your um, fiscal uh, update paper, and it's around the prospects for what's called rather dramatically uh, a Scotland-specific economic shock. Um, and you do make some comments around pages fifteen um, to seventeen around the prospects. Uh, for that, um, uh, and you say it is the likelihood of that being triggered is greater than in a typical year. Now, of course, what that would do is trigger additional borrowing powers to the Scottish government, which I'm sure uh, they would welcome. But do you have any sense on the likelihood uh, of us getting into that territory? Um, I, I again, I can turn to either of my colleagues, but my first response is. We have not um, forecast or predicted the likelihood of getting there. It's just that we are in extraordinary times this year, and uh, that leads us to believe that um, we we don't, you know, we, we just don't know. We don't know how the rest of the year will play out in terms of the pandemic. I mean, nobody knows that at this stage, uh, and so it's possible that this, you know. Scottish specific shock might happen, but so far we haven't seen uh, indices that are saying we're there, we're on the verge of it. Um, Alistair, do you want to add anything to that? Yes, there are two conditions to trigger a Scottish specific economic shock. One is that the growth of Scottish GDP should be less than 1%, and clearly that condition, sadly, is going to be met by a long way. The, the, there are going to be negative growth this year. But the second condition is that growth in Scotland should be le should be more than one percent less than growth in in the UK. Now, uh, what we've seen so far is that growth in the UK has fallen by about twenty five percent in the first quarter in the first quarter of the financial year, and in Scotland by approximately the same. And when you're looking at big numbers like that, you don't need much divergence. To get a one percent difference between them, uh, but as you as you said, Susan, um, so far there hasn't been that one percent divergence. But it's easy to imagine uh, that relatively small differences between the performance of the Scottish and UK economies could trigger a Scottish specific economic shock. But it would clearly be unwise of the Scottish government to assume that that. Uh, trigger uh, that that the Scottish specific economic shock is going to be triggered, and that they will get access to the additional three hundred million pounds of borrowing. We just don't know at this stage. Thank you. Okay, Mordo, thank you. Um, George Adam, please. Thank you, convener, and good morning, Dame Susan. Uh, I'd just like to follow on from what you said just there about the extraordinary times that we live in and the fact that you know with covid-19 the situation we have with the scottish government where you know effectively the, the scottish government is funded in such a way that it's always retrospectively they receive uh, the money so there's less flexibility there with the barnet formula and other promises as well but i've just noted that in your actual submission the your in page 4 section 13 you get pre covid 19 crisis Scottish budget had already increased in size and complexity. Then you go on to talk about the government's uh, responsibilities, the Scottish government's responsibilities, some of which are uh, the social security commitments and things like that as well. Now, the great philosopher in the 60s, Stan Lee, wrote, with great power comes great responsibility. But the Scottish government, we appear to have all the responsibility, but very little of the powers to actually make uh, the difference we need. My question would be, is there a better way 
Is there a way that we could actually get so the government could be more flexible? We talked about borrowing powers for the Scottish Government just previously. Is, is that the way forward, or is there a, a better way for the Scottish Government to be able to actually act in such a way that when we are dealing with this incredible crisis, this worldwide pandemic, where they can actually deal with everything themselves? Because at this time, I am just looking for some form of solution so that we can actually deliver for the people of Scotland. So I very much appreciate the sentiment behind your question, and I'd answer it in, in several different ways, I suppose. Um, first of all, it, it, to some extent, the question you're asking um, would have to receive a response uh, on the political side, not from an independent fiscal body. Um, we couldn't say there's a better way to borrow or interact between the two governments. Um, it, th there is power, uh, and there is, um, to some extent, within Scotland, because the devolved uh, powers give Scotland the ability to um, collect uh, for some taxes revenues in year and keep those going, and also to decide how it wants to uh, expend on a number of uh, social security programs and benefits. And there is power and decisions um, in that, in that um, in terms of the extraordinary times of COVID, um, even if both governments were to decide they wanted to have a conversation about um, you know, shifting the way things were working, my own personal view is this is not the moment to start making fundamental changes in the way we do things. We all, all of us in our nations and collectively across the UK have to get through this period as well as we can. Um, the guaranteed funding, which was one of the requests made by the Scottish Government to the UK Government, was granted, and that, I think, has helped quite a bit. Um, I don't know if either of my colleagues wants to add anything to that. I think Alistair Smith wanted to come in, Susan. Yes, I think that the, the, the COVID experience is, is an interesting test. Of, of devolution powers, because uh, for uh, perfectly understandable economic reasons endorsed by the o OBR, uh, the UK government's COVID response has largely been funded by borrowing, uh, which is uh, a reserved uh, power for the, at the UK government level. Um, so one of the one of the questions that, we, that ought to be asked in the near future is looking back over this experience. Um, it has a response to COVID that has largely been funded by UK borrowing been sufficiently responsive to, to the needs of, of Scotland? And as, uh, as Susan said, uh, our feeling in the Commission is that uh, the time to look at that is when the, the fiscal framework comes up for review. It will be at that point, very interesting to look back at the COVID experience and say, was it the case that the needs of Scotland and the needs of the rest of the UK uh, were so similar that the Scottish Government's uh, policy, desired policy response was sufficiently close to the UK's government, UK Government's desired policy response, uh, that the fiscal framework worked well, or alternatively, the fiscal framework did not give uh, the Scottish Government enough control over its own response to the, the COVID pandemic. Uh, these are questions for uh, the governments to consider when they when they review the fiscal framework in 21-22. Thank you, Professor Smith. That's that's extremely interesting. I'll keep that in mind as we move forward, but. Uh, Dame Susan, in no way am I trying to get you involved in a political rami. I'm just trying to find a, a, a practical way of trying to get delivery uh, out there for uh, the people of Scotland. And you know, even within your own paper, again in page four, section sixteen, you've got the Scottish government's uh, borrowing powers were not designed to manage fiscal stabilisation, which is the responsibility of the UK government. The UK government who borrow on behalf of the UK and either allocate spending for reserved areas or transfer proportional funding to the Scottish Government for dev uh, devolved areas. The Scottish Government is not able to borrow to fund proportionally greater spending 
on its COVID-19 response than the rest of the UK. Now, my argument would be, having read that, would be, is that not part of the problem? Is that not part of the, the issue we have? Because, you know, we constantly hear about uh, political bickering between governments and things like that. But if there was actually a meeting of, uh, there was the powers there, we would be able to actually deal with the issue ourselves uh, and deal with that properly. You know, it, it just seems to me that we still seem to have most of the responsibility, yet none of the powers. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure how to give you a different response to that. I understand your um, concern and why you're asking the question in that way, but it's not in our capability um, to give you uh, an answer to that. And quite honestly, to get a good answer to the question you're raising, I would say again that what I said and what uh, Alistair said, um, it, trying to analyze that and come up with a solution in the middle of a crisis is, to my mind, not the right way to do it, because you really do need to see the denouement. You need to see how things play out and then look back, not, not all the way in the future, but look back soon, and you can come up with a um, much better view of what has worked and what hasn't worked. Um, so that's really the, the best response I can give you. But it's a personal view, uh, actually, about when one goes in to, um, uh, you know, pull up the paving stones fully and look what's underneath. Uh, I don't know, Claire, if you, you would have anything else to maybe a, a more specific response to give than I have. I think the only thing I can add is that the work that we're doing looking at the Scottish budget and how it's funded is, is explaining and trying to add transparency to how the budget works under the current arrangements. I think it's for others to talk about whether the current arrangements are suitable or should be changed. Our focus is very much on trying to improve people's understanding of this because it's, it's not um, super easy to understand how the Scottish Government's funded. It's not a simple process, especially as you add in all the new tax and social security devolution, which has, as we highlight in the report, further added complexity to the Scottish budget. So that's that's our intention, um, which may not address the question you're asking, I'm afraid, but hopefully we can explain where we're coming from. My, my final question would be, you know, the, the frustration I feel and others feel uh, is the fact that we are living in extraordinary times, and you know this is effectively, a, a, you know, it's a it's a worldwide pandemic. It's a health uh, situation. People are dying at this situation, and I, I can understand coming from your point of view where you say we need to look at it at a later date to get all the uh, facts and figures together. But for me, the concern is how are we dealing with it in the here and now? How can we actually deal with this? Because this is life and death. This isn't just an academic study. This is something we need to deal with the here and now. So um, there are kind of two strands, I think, coming out of your uh, comment there. One of them is the health strand, um, that this is a pandemic. It's a matter of health. It's uh, global. It's around the globe. Uh, and, um, you know, I would just say that uh, ultimately I believe that science will get us there and that we will have the uh, mechanisms, um, uh, super fast, easy, cheap testing, vaccinations and so forth to see us out. There will be, there will be, we're in a tunnel, but we will come out of the tunnel at some point. Um, the other strand to what you're asking is the impact that, ha I think, is the impact that has on um, the, you know, economic factors just now. Yeah. Uh, and um, my, understanding is, again, I can't comment politically, um, but that um, businesses uh, have uh, benefited, many have benefit, benefited from the uh, broad uh, schemes, the, the furlough scheme as it's known, and the, the small business um, loan guarantee scheme. Um, the Scottish government um, has offered um, more recently uh, some support to the arts uh, and culture sector, um, which sometimes people say think, oh, that's to the side, but that is actually critically essential to uh, thriving cities uh, in Scotland. So the Scottish government has, um, I think, found places where it can um, focus and create some of its own programs as well. Uh, I don't know what else we could say to you um, 
uh, with our uh, with the limitations of our remit, uh, the constraints of our remit that um, would would take the conversation further. I'm sorry about that. Yeah. Alistair Smith, I think obviously I think he's indicated he'd like to say something as well, George, and then I'm going on to Jackie Bailey. That of, of course, uh, it, when we're talking about issues of life and death, uh, health health responsibilities are devolved. And the Scottish Government has had the responsibility for um, m many aspects of its response, of the response in Scotland to the COVID pandemic, lockdown policies, and so on. Uh, the, the question is, I think, the question for the Fiscal Commission, and maybe the question, the issue behind your question, Mr. Adam, is is whether uh, the whether the Scottish Government gets adequate funding to support its devolved responsibilities. And uh, as uh, Susan said in the introduction, so far the indications are that the funding available has matched uh, in a reasonable way uh, the, the Scottish Government's programmes, but that's something that can be reviewed at the end of the year when we'll have a better overall picture. Thank you, Alistair. Uh, Jackie Bailey, please. you, Dean, Susan, and to your colleagues as well. Um, I think there's no doubt we're heading for a position where it's likely that we will see falling taxes and increasing spending. Um, but I specifically want to focus on Social Security with you, um, because I'm very conscious that the reconciliations for Social Security are in year, and therefore there's an immediate impact on, on the budget. Um, I understand disability benefits account for the main element of social security spending. I'm kind of wondering, could you give us a, an order of magnitude for that? But can you also comment on what you expect might happen as a consequence of the coronavirus restrictions? Do you think the budget will go up? Um, and if so, by how much, I think, is the million dollar question. <laughs> so um, if we all knew the answers to all questions like that, Jackie, <laughs> We'd be in um, in a different place. Um, I would say that uh, in my opening comments, I talked about um, the uh, small response we made to uh, you know costings uh, recently. Um, we have factored in compared to um, March uh, the increase in uptake of universal credit. So that is a trigger for. Uh, some social security benefits, and there has been, as we know, an increase right around the UK and certainly in Scotland uh, to that uptake. So uh, that would lead potentially to greater eligibility for some of the specific benefits or social security uh, programs. Um, I'm going to um, turn to Claire because uh, her remit as one of our um, uh, most senior people in the commission is on the sort of public policy side, but also on social security, and she knows that area inside out. Claire, perhaps you can give a more specific response to that. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Um, so in our report, we talk about a number of the ways that we think social security spending could be affected. So you're absolutely right. Disability benefits account for the bulk of uh, the £3.5 billion of devolved social security. And the main change that we think is going to happen there is that DWP have made a number of changes to how they administer the benefits. So they've suspended face-to-face -face assessments um, given the COVID crisis. They've also paused some reviews. They've made other changes to sort of the administration. And those changes we think will lead, potentially lead to some increases in spending. And that would be in Scotland and the rest of the UK. Um, there's also changes. We, we don't know fully what the effect of COVID is going to be on people's health. Um, you could potentially see increases um, in the demand for these benefits if people's health is affected. And we also know that, sadly, the majority of people that have died from this virus have been older people who are more likely to be in receipt of attendance allowance. So there may be an effect there that potentially reduces spending as well. We will take all of these factors into account when we produce our next forecast in December. Most, most of these effects we will see across the rest of the UK as well. So when the OBR produce their updated forecasts, we'll get an update of the, the block grant adjustment position, which we think should largely offset that. Um, this is obviously the majority of spending, which is um, administered by DWP at the moment. 
there's also this, the benefits which are administered in Scotland and there's several changes which we will factor into our uh, forecast then. So the first one is obviously universal credit um, applications increased a lot and we think that that will push up spending on the, the low income means tested benefits which are administered by Social Security Scotland. Yesterday we published a costing of the new Scottish child payment which the Scottish Government originally planned to launch before Christmas but will now um, make the first payments from February. And in producing that forecast, we took account of the increase in universal credit claims, which pushes up um, spending across our whole forecast horizon. And we also make an assumption that we think take up will increase as well, because we think more people are now aware of the support which is available to them. So all of these factors uh, will affect spending. But I think the majority will probably push spending up slightly. Some may also dampen spending. And it's still very early for us to do an, a forecast at this point in time. We're just making sort of comments at the moment about how, what we think the effect will be. And at the time of the Scottish budget, we'll have a much better estimate of the position in year for the Scottish government, but also what the forecast looked like across the, ne the, the next five years. So I think that's also an important point that we'll know how spending is going to evolve over that period of time. So I hope that answers your question. It does, Convener. That, that's very helpful. I'm very conscious that um, we were coming up from an autumn budget revision, and I'm sure the majority of this quite clearly isn't going to be reflected in that. It's going to be towards the end of the year. Um, but I'm kind of concerned that as the job retention scheme starts to unwind, we're going to see massive spikes in unemployment. Um, and therefore, the consequent impact on you know a range of devolved benefits, everything from the Best Start grant that, that was referenced earlier um, by Claire Murdoch, and also um, you know council tax reduction statistics for which were published yesterday. So, so it's too early then to get an order of magnitude from you, and I need to wait till December, is what you're saying? Uh, yes, I'm afraid. <laughs> I'm afraid so, but. In December, we should have a much better. Well, we'll have, we'll have to make forecasts, even if we don't have much more information. But we will be able to present you with what we think is a better picture than we would be at the current point in time. That's very helpful. Thank you, convener. Uh, thank you, Jackie. Uh, can I now go to Dean Lockhart, please? Thank you very much, uh, convener. I would like to ask uh, the SFC about the fiscal trends highlighted in the most recent JERS figures which show a gap between revenue and expenditure in Scotland of over £15 billion, which was an increase of £2 billion from the previous year. On the expenditure side, uh, the JERS figures reflect only a few weeks of the additional expenditure coming from the UK Government on the COVID response. So This may be part of the reason for the increasing deficit. But I would like to ask, are there other reasons on the revenue side to explain the increasing deficit? For example, are we seeing a decline in the income tax base in Scotland or, or revenues from the income tax base? And are we seeing less revenues being generated from other devolved tax? Um, so if I could begin the response by just reminding everybody that the uh, jurors covers um, uh, or takes a snapshot of uh, or estimates the value of all public spending and all public revenue in and on behalf of Scotland, um, and that covers local government, the Scottish government, and the UK government. So it, it goes well with the devolved um, envelope of devolved taxes and, and, and benefits. Uh, so it would include UK-wide public spending on defence, for instance. For instance, it would include the expenditure of local uh, government where different decisions may be made in different um, bodies around uh, the UK. So I just wanted to remind everybody about that. Um, when you talk about the differential, I'm not sure with the numbers you use whether you're referring to um, overall jurors' values or referring simply to the um, part of that bigger picture which relates to devolved taxes and benefits. Uh, yes, I, I'm, I'm looking at the role of uh, the revenue generated from devolved taxes in the overall component of the deficit. I very much appreciate the SFC doesn't look at, uh, for example, UK government spending in Scotland, but I'm looking at the role of uh, the revenue uh, arising from devolved taxes in that overall increasing fiscal gap. 
Okay, no, th 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 thank you for the clarification. Um, Alistair, I think you're probably ready with the response, so why don't I turn to you? Well, the, the most uh, important devolved tax is, is income tax, accounting for about £11 billion of, of annual revenue to the, the Scottish Government. Um, and, and that's the area where, therefore, one might have the largest concern about whether the Scottish, um, whether the amount of tax that was being raised within Scotland was falling behind uh, the UK. Uh, we will, as uh, you said in your opening remarks, Susan, uh, get an update on the 2018-19 outturn uh, later this month on the 23rd, and we'll be producing a report at the beginning of October. And I think uh, some of our colleagues are then going to appear before the committee. Uh, and uh, and it's af after that update is available is the time to. Well, we will be looking more closely at the question of how the the, tax, the income tax base in Scotland is or is not diverging from the UK tax base, and we will be in a position then to answer your question more fully, Mr Lockhart. Uh, th thank you for that response. Perhaps a, in anticipation of, of next month's outturn figures, you, you could provide a, you know, a summary of the, the main trends we have seen from previous outturn figures in terms of uh, I guess the overestimation in, in some respects of the number of Scottish taxpayers at different uh, bands. Perhaps you could give us a, a highlight of those trends and what the impact of uh, of that uh, overestimation has been on on Scotland's public finances. Alistair, I'll just come back directly to you on that because I see you put an arrow. Well, I, I, th I think we had a discussion about this uh, the last time we appeared before this committee. Uh, uh, and the committee produced a very interesting paper on it. There is some evidence that uh, the expected divergence in 2018-19 is, is as a result of uh, uh, unexpectedly rapid growth of the tax base among the highest taxpayers in the rest of the UK, which frankly probably means among the highest taxpayers in London and the South East. Uh, and, uh, and, and that will certainly be an issue that we and you will want to look at more closely when we have the 2018-19 figures and the 20, the the, the 2021, uh, the the 21-22 reconciliation uh, later this month. That's uh, that's one that that is the headline question. I think uh, to what extent uh, has uh, have income distribution changes. Uh, led to these income ta these divergences in income tax, um, and uh, we it's probably an issue that we will uh, not be able to answer fully uh, in October, but we'll we'll do some initial work on and probably all want to come back to later. That, that's very helpful. Thank you. I, and I guess just my final supplemental question on that: um, Are you seeing anecdotally or, or otherwise? What impact COVID might have on behavioural change, or that that mobility or movement of the higher rate taxpayers within the UK market? Um, I think oh, I'm correct. They, oh, sorry, Alistair, go ahead if you want. I, 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 okay. I was going to say I, 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 I think we have we. <laughs> Alistair, on you go. <laughs> Sorry to cut across you, Susan. Uh, yeah. I, I, uh, I, I, at this point, we simply don't know enough about that. Uh, clearly, there is evidence uh, that uh, that people with higher incomes have done uh, better uh, during the COVID crisis than lower income people because their jobs are more, have been more secure, more opportunities for working from home. And therefore, less exposed to the risk of unemployment. But when we're looking at at what might have happened to the rest of the UK tax base, we're talking about what has happened right up at the very top of the income distribution, and we simply don't know. Uh, well, certainly, I shouldn't say we don't know. I certainly don't know anything about how the COVID crisis has affected 
uh, the, the very highest earners in, in the UK. We, that, that information is not available now, and it's not going to be available next month either. Okay, thank Susan, you very much. You Anything else, Susan? No, uh, Alistair said what I was going to say probably much more eloquently. Right, okay, I'll go to Alexander Burnett then. Thank you. Uh, thank you, convener, and just note, members, to my register of interest. Um, now, if we can start by looking at one of the many levers that are under the Scottish Government control, namely LBTT, um, you know, you've, this, this accounts for the majority of a shortfall of the devolved taxes. Uh, mm -hmm. But in the introduction, you point out that the majority of this shortfall cannot be attributed to COVID. Uh, so, can I just ask what the fundamental reasons you think are that this tax is not raising as much as it should be? Um, it's, so, Blair, can I um, turn to you? I mean, it's a lot of variability in our forecast in the last couple of years. Um, we overpredicted LBTT revenues by about 3%, um, mainly because we overestimated how many transactions would be in the top two bands uh, and that you know that is where the largest amount comes in uh, in receivables uh, and um, you know it's it's not just the overall number of transactions it's where they fall in the different bands of LBTT um, but Claire you would you give a more specific response please thank you Susan so you um you've just highlighted there the resident uh, we had a forecast error on residential transactions I should say this is not us saying that Revenues should have raised this. This is saying compared to what we thought they were going to raise, this is how much revenue they raised. Um, so, re uh, residential LBTT revenues we um, over predicted by 3%, which is £9 million. But actually, the, the largest forecast error that we had was on the non residential side. Um, and the reason there really is that non residential revenues are highly concentrated in very high value transactions. And if you have slightly fewer of these very high value transactions than you thought, then you raise quite a lot less uh, revenue. So you don't have to get it very wrong to end up with a tax, a sort of revenue forecast error that's, that's slightly larger. Um, and so the real reason there was we forecast there were going to be um, 550 transactions worth more than £2 million that would take place in the last financial year. In actual fact, there were 506 transactions, and that, that accounts for a big chunk of that forecast error. And obviously, we take account of this when we produce our next set of forecasts, although what happened last year will obviously not be a perfect predictor of what's going to happen this year or next year, given um, we've had quite a big uh, crisis that's happened uh, since then. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, that the majority of this forecast error is just slightly fewer transactions right at the top taking place. Yeah, yeah. thank you. It very much shows the sensitivity in, in certain bands can have a, have a major impact. Uh, can I just ask you to confirm, if I'm, if I'm reading uh, uh, paragraph uh, 321 correct, it says you've underestimated the number of transactions and therefore your forecast would have been higher. Are you actually therefore saying the shortfall would also be is higher? And therefore, the points you've actually made you know, is, is actually worse than what the figures show. Um, I'll, I'll need to find the exact figures, but some, if, I think on the residential side, we underestimated the number of transactions, but we slightly overestimated the price, assum our price assumption, so prices weren't quite as high as we thought. So when you take those two things into account, that slightly those those sort of forecast errors slightly offset themselves on the residential side. Okay, thank you. Uh, and, and just going forward, you know, the OBR. Uh, it, it hasn't formally updated uh, its forecast, but it has produced uh, updated scenarios, uh, uh, optimistic, central and pessimistic, uh, for tax revenues and spending, uh, which have then go on to you know, in, inform its other costings. Uh, can I ask why you haven't produced any uh, fiscal scenarios along the lines of the OBR? Is it a resource issue or is there any other reason? Uh, and if you, uh, maybe if you had, you know, or do you have any expectation that with LBTT, uh, the higher the transaction volumes might catch up towards the end of the year. I think Susan's going to answer that first. Sorry, Susan. Sorry. Bruce, tell tell us who should answer. <laughs> okay, I'm, yeah, listen, Claire was Claire was on the on, on the ball there, so I'll just let her keep going and then we'll come, if you want to come back in, Susan, let me know. Claire. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So you're asking why we haven't produced updated scenarios. So we 
set out what we think is happening broadly in the Scottish economy, giving that context. Um, in terms of the Scottish budget, what really matters um, for the budget position is not just about what we think is happening to Scottish tax revenues, but it's about what's happening to Scottish tax revenues relative to the rest of the UK. And the scenarios the OBR have produced are very helpful in giving that kind of broad indication of what's going to happen, but that they haven't produced forecasts which can be used to calculate the block grant adjustments. So if we produced a forecast that said, say, LBTT revenues are going to fall and then sort of present that in the Scottish budget, it would make the position look pretty bad. But obviously, once the updated block grant adjustment figures are known, you'll have both of those figures together so you know the funding position and you know the revenue position and at that point in time we'll have a much better estimate of what's happening to the Scottish budget so we'll be doing that um, alongside the Scottish budget which is now expected to be in December I don't know if Susan or Alistair want to add anything to that I would simply say that um, the OBR have done their scenarios I believe the Fraser of Allender have done scenarios there are other scenarios out there so in terms of informing thinking more generally there is a, that's available uh, yeah, well, thank you thank you and, and just finally uh, to, to Dame Susan uh, you, know, you mentioned in the uh, the data needs paper uh, the issue over transparency with the Scottish Government uh, making information public which yeah, unfortunately seems to be a bit of a re reoccurring theme at the moment uh, can I just ask are you making any progress uh, on this matter well, I think overall, I think in the re I think overall in the report, we we noted that there has been um, a lot of progress, and uh, we believe that uh, we have a very good um, dialogue with the Scottish government about data needs, um, and these have improved over time. So we're simply um, adding each year to what would be even more helpful. Uh, obviously. Um, data we, we try in our forecast because of our commitment to transparency and to being able to have anyone who looks at our work understand what lies underneath it. Uh, we want to use public data to the fullest extent possible. Sometimes governments, uh, this one or other ones, want to hold back data because they're not certain about its, uh, you know, you, either waiting to, to check it or it, when it comes in or for whatever reason and will ultimately make it public. It's just we have a timetable. So we're really looking at how to um, just match our needs for our analysis with the government's needs for uh, handling its data in some respects. Overall, um, there's been uh, a movement towards progress here. Thank you. That's all. Right, Tom Arthur, please. Thank you, convener, and good morning. Um, for simplicity, I'll ask this question to Dame Susan. Appreciate she managed to delegate it to one of her colleagues. Um, my first question concerns the um, sustainability of UK debt, and I raise that with reference to uh, paragraph 21 of the fiscal update report. This is in the summary. It makes reference to the possibility that the UK government may, we, uh, may wish to um, rebalance its fiscal policy potentially by increasing. Uh, what are what would be devolved taxes, and that would have a knock-on impact in Scotland. Um, I appreciate your um, remit is within with regards to um, uh, the fiscal policy within Scotland, but given that um, intimate connection, I wonder if you're able to perhaps sketch out what a, an objective definition of sustainable debt would be, and whether or not the UK government's current position vis-à-vis -vis its debt is sustainable or would it necessitate. Um, intervention through the use of fiscal levers such as increasing income tax at a UK level? Uh, a big question, and certainly the last part of the question, uh, we wouldn't be in a position to comment on the sustainability of the UK's uh, approach to it. I see that Alistair um, has uh, put his virtual hand up, uh, and I wonder if you want to respond more specifically. Yes, I, I, ha, happy to do so. Uh, uh, as you said, Susan, uh, the Scottish Fiscal Commission has no responsibility for commenting on the fiscal sustainability uh, of the uh, UK government's policy. And it's at the UK level that fiscal sustainability arises as an issue, because, as we discussed earlier, um, borrowing for fiscal borrowing is is a, a reserve power to the UK government. Uh, the, but turning to what the OBR has said, it's, it, it seems that the OBR is 
I wouldn't want to put words in their, in their mouth, but my interpretation would be that they're relatively relaxed about the growth of UK government borrowing in the short run in the context of the, 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 the COVID crisis and additional borrowing of 130, 150 billion pounds uh, at a time that interest rates are very low uh, seems to be something that the OBR is, is quite relaxed about. But everyone assumes that borrowing, um, well, it, it's right to assume that borrowing eventually has to be repaid. Uh, and it's, it's quite right that when uh, the UK government seeks to uh, bring its borrowing back down, it will need to raise taxes or uh, cut expenditures and cutting expenditures in devolved areas or raising uh, taxes in devolved areas uh, will have direct impacts on uh, the Scottish Government budget in the future. That's, if you like, the way uh, that borrowing is being, borrowing which is being done at the UK level by the UK Government, that's part of the way in which Scotland's share of that gets repaid in the long run through the impact on Scottish taxes and Scottish expenditure. Uh, thank you, Professor Smith. I wonder if I could just clarify, the, the, if I, please correct me if I misunderstood you, but if, if I understand you correctly, you suggested that it's ultimately going to be a binary choice or combination of public expenditure cuts or increases in taxation. I presume then you think, given the uh, gravity of the economic crisis we're facing, there's no possibility of um, the UK's fiscal position becoming sustainable simply through economic growth. It will require. Um, I'm asking this just as, a, as an, an objective question of economic analysis. That simply, it's not. It's going to be beyond the, the realms of possibility for the UK as a whole to for its economy to grow to such a level that revenues are generated, which can bring public finances into a sustainable footing. It will need a, a a fiscal intervention. Well, it, it, it would be a very happy, well, not, not very happy future. It would certainly be an optimistic future if uh, rates of economic growth in the future were high relative to uh, rates of interest on the debt. Uh, the, to the extent that that case, one can be uh, relaxed about the debt burden. Uh, but it's probably prudent to assume that when uh, a government takes on a, a large amount of additional debt, as the UK government is doing in this year, it's prudent to assume that uh, not all of that is going to be painlessly repaid as a result of economic growth. But it's, uh, I'm not disagreeing with, with the underlying assumption of your question. If we could be very optimistic about economic growth, uh, we have to be less uh, wide about the, the burden of future debt. That's absolutely right. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Smith. My second question is, is, is a process question um, that we often come back to in these exchanges in this committee uh, with yourselves. Um, the SFC Office is a relatively young um, organisation, um, and particularly with the new Social Security spending coming online this year. We've acknowledged in previous exchanges that it may take a, a period of time before building up sufficient knowledge to help really um, hone in and make predictions as accurate as possible. With regard to the, the disruptive impact that COVID has had and the significant and, you know, financial interventions that there have been, um, what impact does this have upon the robustness of your for forecasts going forward two and three years? And do you think that will delay getting to a point where you would be confident that you'll be able to accrue that early learning to um, enhance the accuracy of your forecasts? Yeah. So, uh, shall I start? Um, let me start by saying you described us as a relatively young organization. Um, and yes, we are that, but uh, young and, and finely formed, I would say, um, on behalf of uh, the whole team in the organization. Um, the SFC responded wisely and very quickly, actually back in January, sort of in February, seeing what was likely coming. And we equipped all of our teams to be able to work effectively and um, and collegiately from uh, their home bases. So we we haven't 
sort of missed a beat. You, you talked about process. There's something about having the capability and the equipment and all the rest of it to do our work. And we haven't missed a beat there. That's really important. Um, in terms of accuracy of forecasts, forecasts, a small reminder that forecasts are never right. Uh, as we know, we always try to get them closer and closer and understand each year why they the outturn or the actuals varied from what we had forecast. Um, but some of that is not only, and this gets back to a process question, not only relating to our work, um, we continue to refine our models. So, so that's an example of work that we've carried on over this period, as well as doing whatever else we do. That should help um, as the models mature and we understand things better, uh, should help with accuracy. But uh, you mentioned Social Security benefits specifically. As some of the newer ones come on, if you look at um, our accuracy in general, the benefits that came on first, we have forecast um, you know, in, in very good uh, range. The ones that came on more recently, forecasts were not as good, sometimes because of the nature of the way they were introduced, sometimes because of the timing of when they were introduced, which may change, uh, sometimes because of eligibility. Um, so when we have a new benefit, uh, and this would apply, I suppose, to a new tax at any point um, that's coming online, there will always be greater uncertainty. And we all learn, those who collect uh, and administer, as well as ourselves in terms of the analysis. Um, Alice, do you want to add to that? Yes, uh, and first I'd like to, to uh, add my uh, compliments to your Susan, to the staff of the Fiscal Commission who have worked tremendously well over the last few months in, in these very changed circumstances. Uh, and on the substance of it, yes, forecasting is going to be difficult uh, over the next year or so, because uh, information about what's going on in the economy uh, is, is coming in uh, only gradually. There are very unusual circumstances. Uh, it's harder to speculate about how things might evolve over the next year or two. There are many more unknowns. But we will produce forecasts um, in, uh, in, to accompany the Scottish Government budget, which we expect to be in December. The, we're, we're limbering up uh, to do that now. Uh, these forecasts will be subject to much greater uncertainties than our forecasts in the past. Uh, we will all be astonished <laughs> if our forecast evaluation report of our 2021 forecasts turns out to be as good as our forecast evaluation report this year. Uh, and, and perhaps the most important thing to say, because as Claire has reminded us a couple of times, one of the big uncertainties of the, the Scottish Government budget is about differences between uh, UK revenues and expenditure, and Scottish revenues and expenditure, and the uh, large parts of the budget are set on the basis of forecasts from us and the OBR. Both organisations will be doing their best in December to produce the most accurate forecasts possible, but with the best will in the world, uh, divergences between our, out our outturn and our forecast, and divergences between UK outturns on the OBR forecasts are going to be greater than normal, and that's one of the questions that will will have to be considered. What we have learned about COVID and the fiscal framework, whether the fiscal framework makes enough provision uh, for adjustments arising from forecast error in circumstances squared with the best will in the world, there are likely to be very much larger forecast errors than have, that have been in the past. Um, could I just add, thank you for that, Alice, a footnote to, to this discussion. We were previously asked about data, data availability, and uh, that also is, in a process sense, essential to our, you know, the efficacy of our forecasting ability. Um, you all know, I think, that we're part of an international OECD network of independent fiscal institutions. And Claire and I joined um, a virtual meeting uh, a few couple of months back, and the number of other countries which were saying 
during the pandemic, particularly early months, they just weren't able to get the data they would normally get at all. Um, and the, the, the fiscal institutions there were saying this was a great worry. Uh, I think it's fair to say that um, we have done quite well in Scotland, and I think in the UK, I will look specifically at the bodies that give us data in Scotland. They've done a good job of keeping us pretty up to date through all of this, and that's very helpful as well. Thank you very much. As, as much as I would like to uh, continue this exchange, I'm conscious of time, so I'll conclude there, convener. Okay, just before I go to Alec Rowley, I want to continue that exchange because, and Alistair, you just said something pretty important, and I think we need to pick up on it about COVID and the impact on the economy and the uncertainty and destabilising effect of it, and effectively the turbulence it's created. What you're signalling up to us is there's a significant danger point potentially coming around understandable forecast error, which is made because we, we just do not know what the COVID situation will throw up, and this potential for significant divergence between what the OBR believe and the SFC believe. Now, I'm not saying that's going to happen, but the potential is there. Does that not signal up to us a danger point? in terms of the potential impact on the Scottish budget that we need to become very aware of? Alistair. It, it, it's not so much a danger point for the, for the, 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 the Scottish, Scottish budget immediately as the risk that the forecasts that go into the Scottish budget uh, turn out to, um, and I'm sorry, <laughs> very inevitable difficulty with talking about Two forecasts and two divergences from the forecast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think the, the the source of what you call turbulence—it wasn't my word—arises uh, not so much from the fact that the budget, the budget depends on our forecast and the OBR forecast, and if they diverge, uh, then that has budget effects. But I think the bigger risk is that our forecast errors might diverge from the OBR's forecast errors when we see the outcome. And it turns out, even if our forecasts were quite close together, so that the, the budget position was set on relatively similar forecasts, if the Scottish outturn is different from our forecast in one direction and the UK outcome is different from the OBR's forecast in the other direction, then there would be reconciliations um, required, which uh, which might tax. Sorry, <laughs> might be put strain on uh, the Scottish government's borrowing powers. That's th th yeah. I, I reckon. I reckon that it's not an immediate. It's not an immediate danger point, but it's something we need to be aware of for, for future purposes. Okay, um, Alec Rowley, please. Um, I want to ask a question about capital, but before I do, can I go back to the, the point that Tom Arthur was was making? Um, I mean, you do point to the OBR fiscal sustainability report of July this year, where, where you quote them saying it seems likely that there will need to raise tax revenues or reduce spending as a national share of the, a, a national income uh, to put the public finances in a sustainable way. But are we clear there that that, that would be a political choice, just as austerity? Was a political choice coming out of the the last economic downturn, uh, and that the options are there for government. That is simply one option. Are we sort of clear on that? Yeah. Sorry, were you directing that question to Claire, or I, did I miss, or just generally? Yeah. Um, you I think. What you are suggesting is a great deal has been borrowed because that's in the hands of the UK government to borrow for a crisis like this, and the assumption that at some point the borrowing needs to be reduced um, or paid back, whatever term one wants to um, one wants to put to it. Uh, there are choices in terms of how that happens, and I assume choices when. That would happen. You asked if this was a political decision primarily. I think those choices would be political decisions. Yeah. Okay. So if I come back to because some 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 commentators have talked about the the post-war consensus and 
the Keynesian approach to driving the economy and rather than trying to cut our way out of debt, we actually grow our way out of debt. So that was really what I was trying to refer to there. It was a, austerity is a political choice. But can I ask specifically about Scotland and, and the capital expenditure? Have you got any idea of the current position with regard to capital programmes and whether there is underspend and the scale of that underspend, if it is taking place? And you, have, you do say that the flexibility has been, and in fact, the, the precedent is there previously, where the Scottish governments have been able to borrow more in terms of capital, they've been able to exceed the capital limits. Is your view that that is a possibility for us looking forward if we took the political choice to grow the economy and grow, grow our way to pay the debt back? Um, so, two parts to your question. The first is, have things slowed down in terms of capital investment? And second, um, and it's a good question, can um, the use of uh, the capital up in some way to uh, to help um, grow the economy? Um, I don't have numbers to hand, and one of my colleagues may, and I suspect Claire will, um, but uh, the um, the fact that construction ceased, the fact that that you know everything ceased, particularly in the early part of lockdown, um, means that will have slowed down. There's no question about that. I mean, a lot of them have started up again and so on and so forth. But um, there certainly was a very big hiccup at that point. But Claire, can I turn to you um, with uh, perhaps you've got some more specific uh, numbers to respond to the question? Yes, thank you, Susan. Um, so just in terms of the capital budget, so in our report, we set out the level of funding the Scottish Government currently has for capital spending. We also highlight how the OBR um, in their report expect um, underspends this year across departments, particularly on capital. It is likely that you would that the Government will spend less. And I think the question is more for the Scottish Government when they present their autumn budget revision to Parliament in terms of whether they have an expectation of capital underspends this year um, to we will obviously pick that up in our report in December alongside the Scottish budget when we know more about that. Um, you also talked about capital borrowing. The Scottish Government can borrow £450 million pounds a year for capital um, spending. They plan this year to borrow the maximum. We'll see whether that happens. And you also talk a bit about the flexibility. So in the past, Treasury has allowed the Scottish Government to draw down more from its capital reserve. Um, and that was because they received very late negative consequentials from the UK government in the financial year. So Treasury allowed them to um, fund that, that gap by drawing down from the reserve. Obviously, they've used money in the reserve. If they have underspends this year, they can put it back into the reserve and they can use it in another financial year. So those options are available to the Scottish government. Okay, thank you. Jimena. Okay, thank you very much, Alec. Um, okay, um, can I thank our witnesses very much for their evidence today, Dame Susan Rice, Professor Alistair Smith, and Claire Murdoch. That concludes our business for today, and I now.